pages 6 to 11 and if you're content then I'll sign them accordingly. Read. Yeah, some matters arising. In terms of the oral evidence, uh, Amnesty International were to be here today. It didn't suit, so they're being rescheduled to one of the other sessions. Uh, and there's a letter um, for that. Uh, other item is there's a, a letter uh, received from uh, the director of the BBC uh, regarding the request to attend a committee meeting in closed session. Um, and uh, Mr. Johnson has now acceded to the request from the committee to do that. And he'll be coming to the committee. So we're going to try and arrange that for some time in February. Um, because when we hope to have them um, before the committee, and it'll be a closed session. There's the forward work programme on pages 18 to 26. Um, we agreed in our meeting on the 10th of December oral evidence sessions and human trafficking bill. They have been scheduled for today um, and other meetings. All other non-urgent oral briefings are being scheduled for February. Arrangements for uh, the evidence event on the human trafficking bill that the committee has agreed to hold and the organisations to be invited will be discussed at our meeting next week. Um, Item 4 is correspondence from the Northern Ireland Judicial Appointments Ombudsman regarding the High Court Judge competition, and they're on pages 27 to 29. The uh, Judicial Appointments Ombudsman has written um, in relation to the investigations that we're looking into around the High Court Judge competition. Had a, he's indicated that uh, he recognises the committee has a legitimate and ongoing interest in the administration of justice in Northern Ireland, of which judicial appointments are part, and he's therefore willing to attend on the 16th of January. He does highlight that there are some uh, constraints upon the evidence that he uh, is able to give. Um, and whether or not we would still want to proceed with them coming, I suspect members still do. Um, the Ombudsman also highlights that it's now a matter for the committee to consider if all the material relating to his investigation should be placed in the public domain and the implications that that may have. So um, if members are agreed, we'll obviously continue with the meeting uh, of the Ombudsman uh, next week. Uh, at this stage, we'll not obviously publish the material that we've received. Um, and that's something that we we would need to consider at a, an appropriate point. Item five is correspondence from Judge Marlon, and uh, it's a copy of correspondence between Lady Herman MP and the Lord Chancellor regarding his complaint and the delay in making the appointment to the High Court uh, vacancy. And those papers are at 32 to 35, and they're for members' information. Item five is. Um, the Human Trafficking, Exploitation, Further Provisions and Support for Victims Bill, um, and it's the oral evidence that we're now going to receive. Um, we have three um, groups, individuals, that are coming with us today to help the committee in our deliberations, and the first one we're going to hear from is Rihanna. Um, so if those representatives want to step forward to the table. Um, the bill and memorandum are at tab one of the bill folder, and a copy of the written evidence from Rehama is at pages 37 to 60 of that of the meeting folder. Um, so let me formally welcome uh, Sarah Benson, Chief Executive of Rehama, and uh, Geraldine Rowley. Rowley? Rowley? Rowley. Rowley. Thank you. Um, who's the Policy and Communications Manager of Rehama to the meeting. So uh, you're both very welcome. Um, we appreciate you taking uh, the time to come to hear us. Um, obviously, it's an important issue that the committee's looking into, and we're trying to, to gather as much information to inform us as we can. So this meeting will be recorded by Hansard, and it'll obviously be published then uh, in due course. So at this stage, I'm going to hand over to yourselves. If you can briefly outline to us um, the issues, and then I think members will have some questions. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so good afternoon, and um, <coughs> firstly, I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to address you today. Um, as I said, my name is Sarah Benson. I'm the CEO of Ruhama, and I've been with the organisation for three and a half years. And prior to this, I've worked for over a decade in the area of violence against women and with <coughs> ethnic minorities. And my colleague today uh, is Geraldine Rowley, our policy and communications manager, who has 15 years frontline experience with the organisation and four years prior to this, working with women in prostitution through a street outreach project in Belfast. Um, so for those of you who are not perhaps familiar with us as an organisation, perhaps just a few words to um, introduce ourselves. Uh, we've been operating for 
two and a half decades uh, as a support service ex- exclusively for women affected by prostitution. And our client group today includes women who are currently involved in prostitution, uh, so actively involved indoors and on street, women exiting prostitution with a history uh, of uh, prostitution and victims of trafficking for sexual exploitation. Uh, Due to the highly mobile nature of the sex trade, where women move or are moved around the island of Ireland, our client group does include women who have been affected by prostitution and sex trafficking in Northern Ireland also. Um, Our service is a holistic, person-centred, non-judgmental service that responds to women's individual needs, um, ranging from practical, educational, career planning, but also emergency crisis situations, immigration, health, family, housing, legal and criminal justice (coughs) issues also. Uh, Women affected by prostitution and sex trafficking engage with us for a broad range of supports. Some of them are very large and complex, some are quite (coughs) small and simple, and in the course of working collaboratively with them, we share not only their challenges, but also fundamentally their hopes and uh, dreams and their plans and successes. To give a sense of our output for 2012, we responded to 258 women in 2012 with our in-depth casework service responding to 170 women uh, with 908 face-to-face contacts, uh, over 13,000 phone calls and 5,200 text supports. In addition, we operate a street outreach service uh, with a van that engages with women in street prostitution, which went out on uh, 108 occasions and engaged with 62 women exclusively in a street situation. Um, And in addition, there were 26 other women who we assisted with initial support uh, to either access follow-on services somewhere else or who didn't uh, go on to engage with our casework. Just before I continue, I just acknowledge that I'm, I'll refer throughout to women in prostitution, but while the vast majority of women, uh, of those in prostitution are women and girls, uh, there are also a small number of men and a significant minority of transgender persons, and Ruhama offers support service, uh, services to any person identifying as having a female gender, so including trans. And while our more comprehensive services don't extend to men, we'll always attend to any person's presenting needs and endeavour to identify appropriate support services for them also. So while we continue to work with uh, significant numbers of Irish women, um, it's important to note that the majority of those in the indoor sex trade in particular are migrant women, and this would be reflected by the fact in 2012 we worked with women of 32 different nationalities. Uh, Ruhama firmly believes that prostitution is both intrinsically harmful and violent to women and girls involved, as well as the significant physical damage and risk There is emotional and psychological harm. Being in prostitution can erode self-esteem, self-confidence, can cause depression and symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. As well as the harm to each individual involved, there is the social, cultural and global impact, the damage to the social position and perception of women, both nationally and globally. If one woman's body is perceived as being for sale, the implication is that all women and girls are potentially for sale, and this directly undermines the potential for gender inequality, or gender equality, I should say. If we don't recognise the harm of prostitution and the very real challenges of getting out once you find yourself in that life, then as a society we stop very far short of meeting the needs of those who need support. Those who argue in favour of prostitution tend to take a very utopian view of the sex trade. They'll say, regulate it and it'll be okay. This will eliminate child prostitution, eliminate trafficking, it'll make it safer for everybody involved. But the reality is that this is an utterly unattainable goal. The reality is that prostitution in and of itself is predicated on the availability of vulnerable young girls and the exploitation of vulnerability of impoverished women, usually in this context migrant women, in order to ensure that the demand for sex for sale is met. As a support service, We're completely non-judgmental of individual women's involvement in prostitution because we understand the complexities of entry and involvement. However, after 25 years of witnessing and hearing from women about their experiences, the awful challenges they often face, it is just impossible not to judge the systems and structures and the other stakeholders who complete the picture. Pimps are not agents or managers. They are pimps, making money off the backs of others for high profits and at low risk to themselves. Buyers don't care about the reality of women and girls that they buy. This has been well documented because their focus is wholly selfish in these transactions. The commercial sex trade across this island remains very active and highly organised. There are numerous criminal gangs organising and profiting from the prostitution and trafficking of vulnerable women and girls in urban and rural settings, and there are no regard for borders here. To separate trafficking out from organised prostitution defies logic, given the mechanisms by which the sex trade operates. 
victims of trafficking are advertised in the same places as all other forms of commercial sex trade, not in some separate corner of the internet that's restricted to trafficking. And one clear example of this, which is in the public domain, is the Thomas Joseph Carroll case. TJ Carroll was convicted of organising prostitution and associated crimes in 2010 in Cardiff. He ran brothels right across the island of Ireland, from Waterford to Newry to Enniskillen. And in these premises were women who had been brutally trafficked, alongside women who had responded to other forms of recruitment. And we've worked with women involved with Carol who fit both of these categories. They were in the same buildings together, and they were advertised on the same escort websites. And this is by no means the only example of this scenario that we have direct experience of. A cohesive approach to organised prostitution is also the means by which perpetrators and victims of trafficking can be identified and assisted. The need to relate responses to sex trafficking with the issue of prostitution has been clearly recognised by the European Commission, with the EU anti-trafficking coordinator Miria Vassiliadu reiterating publicly the Commission's view that sex trafficking and prostitution are linked as recently as December 2013. The 2011 EU Directive on Trafficking calls on states to tackle demand. And while criminalising the purchase of services from a victim of trafficking in relation to labour or domestic servitude may be an effective deterrent and practically policeable, the offence in relation to sex trafficking simply doesn't work. Finland were the first to enact such a law, which is similar to that which is in place currently in Northern Ireland, and they have this year, or last year, independently evaluated that and determined that it has been an absolute failure in tackling sex trafficking, and their Minister for Justice has now called on a change to enact legislation similar to that enacted in Sweden. So we talk a lot about the Swedish model, but this is actually about examining the Swedish example. We would believe that each jurisdiction needs to develop its own model, and Rahama believes that there is scope to create an environment in Northern Ireland which is both hostile to those criminally organising and truly profiting from prostitution, while recognising and ensuring that those who nonetheless find themselves in prostitution are supported and not criminalised. There is no human right to buy sex. Sex buyers are not a vulnerable group whose rights need protecting in this regard. And more importantly, the minority, because it is a minority, of men who buy sex drive a large and profitable criminal trade. If we target the sex buyer, this not only hits at the profit base of organised crime, but also sends such a clear message that buying sex is not socially acceptable. Increasingly, the sex trade is becoming normalised, but a message like this would challenge and give a clear indication that this is not a casual, harmless transaction. There are direct and sometimes disastrous human consequences. And we're not talking about an offence to lock men up and throw away the key but rather one that sends a strong social signal. In just the same way that we enact legislation on drink driving or speeding, the law is needed in order to protect people and minimise the collateral damage of the behaviour of a few. There are sometimes criticisms of the Swedish example. However, having visited Sweden and from our ongoing contact with frontline support providers there, we'd refute these. No one is saying that prostitution and trafficking can be wholly eradicated. But the Swedes enacted a law that not only recognised the harm to those in the sex trade, but also the harm to society, and particularly equality between men and women. And they enacted a law to try and minimise these. The sex trade has shrunk, shrunk its street prostitution halving. And while the internet has been responsible for some indoor prostitution, as it has across the entire of the global north, there is no evidence to suggest that those on street simply moved indoors. And indoor prostitution is lower than in neighbouring countries. Further, police and support services alike report that some women are actually more willing to report harm as they know they will not be criminalised, and some report even using the fact that the buyer will be criminalised as leverage in, in dangerous situations to stop buyers perpetrating harm. Rather than focusing on the often spurious and unsubstantiated comments on the failure of this example, we feel it is more constructive to examine the calamitous failure of those states that took a different approach and tried to regulate the sex trade. The call to legalise or regulate prostitution can sometimes come from a very genuine concern for the welfare for the women involved. The assumption is that if prostitution can be constructed as work, that it will thereby lessen the threat of harm and stigmatisation and instances of trafficking. Others making this argument, however, are promoters of the sex trade, pimps, procurers and traffickers. They have a vested interest in promoting this model of legislation because the benefits for them would be enormous. They no longer be considered criminals but become legitimate businessmen and women. The evidence from jurisdictions where regulation and legalisation have been in place for over a decade demonstrate that aspirations to make prostitution a safe, legitimate form of work for women were ill-founded. 
in Germany. An extensive evaluation published in 2007 indicates that there is no evidence that women are safer. Only a tiny number of women have accessed health insurance or registered as sex workers. The illegal sector continues to grow and profit, and the people who have benefited the most are organisers and owners of the businesses. In the Netherlands, extensive evaluation of the industry has found that legalisation has not resulted in any more safety for women, but rather a massive legal and illegal trade in migrant women and girls. Prostitution was decriminalised in New Zealand in 2003, and after a decade of this form of legislation, there is evidence to show that it has some disturbing consequences for the women involved, and has resulted in an increase in prostitution in at least some areas. One can safely draw the conclusion that when prostitution is considered as work, whether through legalisation, regularisation or decriminalisation of the stakeholders other than those who are in prostitution, it results in the normalising of the buying of sex and the sex trade increases, including sex trafficking. The New Zealand Prostitution Law Review Committee noted that street prostitution in Auckland had doubled in just one year, with press reports and local support services suggesting even higher increases. Decriminalised prostitution in New Zealand not only made prostitution acceptable and encouraged men to buy sex, but it also transformed prostitution into a more attractive option for young, poor women. In one of the PLRC's own surveys, 25% of those involved in prostitution interviewed stated that they had entered the sex trade because it had been decriminalised. For those in the sex trade, it is important that they receive the message that they are not criminalised and can seek health, emotional, practical and police support when needed. Also, exiting supports are critical and in jurisdictions where the sex trade is decriminalised or legalised, these tend to fall away, be under-resourced or non-existent because if something is a normal job, why would you need to exit it? The other key objective must be to prevent exploitation in the first place, and laws that decriminalise the seller but hit at the demand that fuels the sex trade will also support <coughs> this objective. So, in summary, we support the enacting of the Morrow Bill, including Clause 6, criminalising the buyers. So, thank you. And if you have any questions. Sorry, thank you very much. Um, Sydney Anderson has the first questions. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Sharon and Geraldine, for coming to the committee today. <coughs> Thank you for that very detailed submission. Uh, I have a number of, of questions, Chair, if you, if you allow me, uh, maybe to get through these uh, as quickly as possible. But In your submission, uh, you outline you've been working with women in prostitution since uh, 1989 in, in the Republic of Ireland. Could you provide an overview of the work that you do in this area and how many women, on average, do you work with each year? You may have touched on mm -hmm. some of this. What percentage of your clients who are involved in, po uh, in prostitution uh, voluntarily or under the control or coercion of a pimp or, to or a trafficker. Can Sorry, you break that down? Uh, we, we, can, we can break down the number who are trafficked and don't fit the narrow definition of trafficking. As to the women who might be associated with uh, pimps, we wouldn't have definitive information on that. Um, a large number of the women who we are supporting who are still actively involved in the sex trade would, particularly in the indoor arena. Um, last year, and I'm speaking off the top of my head, although you have it there, actually. Yeah. I'll let Geraldine yeah. maybe respond to the, um, the breakdown of trafficked, not trafficked, of the 258 women that we worked with last year. Yeah. Um, just to say that overall, Ruhama, in 25 years, would have certainly worked with well over <coughs> 2,000 women. And uh, when Ruhama was set up 25 years ago, prostitution was predominantly based in the major urban regions, uh, such as Belfast, Dublin, Galway, Cork, Limerick, on the island of Ireland. But um, over the years, we have seen, particularly over the last decade, a huge increase in prostitution. And because of the, the internet and because of probably borders across Europe and also on our own island, less border control, we've seen huge mobility of the, the sex trade. And due to that, uh, the majority of women, which our figures show uh, over the last number of years in our services, the majority of women we work with are actually uh, foreign women coming from countries like Eastern Europe, South America, um, countries in Africa. And because it's very mobile, we work with women who are located and who have been moved around Northern Ireland. Uh, and we've worked with victims of trafficking who were based in Northern Ireland. Uh, last year, we worked with 170 women in casework. Well, overall, we worked with 258 women. This is just an example. Like Each year, we would work with 
over 200 women on, on average, well over 200 women. Last year we worked with a record number of 258 women. We have a street outreach programme still. It, it was the beginning of Ruhama was a street outreach programme programme in Dublin, and that still continues to women in street-based prostitution. But the majority of prostitution on the island of Ireland, and I can vouch for this from my own experience, because I worked in the 90s for four years in Belfast in a street outreach project, and even then most prostitution in Belfast was street-based. But in Belfast and throughout the uh, island of Ireland, prostitution uh, is much more indoors. Again, uh, the introduction of telecommunications has very much facilitated that. Uh, there is much more organised prostitution uh, and trafficking. And the majority of women we work with are in indoor prostitution. Uh, we provided, out of that 258 women that we provided service to last year, 170 women uh, were in our casework section, which means they were getting emotional support, very practical support, perhaps advocacy helping them because quite a lot of women um, maybe from other countries were helping them with their residency. We help women um, who are still in prostitution. Um, women who access our service don't necessarily need to leave prostitution. We work with anyone who is affected by prostitution. And the fact that we are around 25 years, sometimes women who have a history of prostitution also come to us. Um, so we work with women basically on whatever their presenting needs are. Perhaps sometimes they need health checks uh, and we would accompany them uh, and help them access health services. They sometimes need legal assistance. The, we are the only project on the island of Ireland that provides clear uh, exiting programmes. So that's women who say they want to get out of prostitution. Then we have clear programmes and one route uh, out of prostitution uh, one support programme is certainly education and development programmes, and we have ran those since the mid-1990s, um, because many women who find themselves in prostitution, it is due to lack of options uh, and poverty, and often education and training not alone gives women a certificate and, and, and perhaps training and education, but it also empowers them uh, and builds their self-esteem and confidence. And we have a range of personal development programs, uh, training, education. We also help women who may need uh, accommodation. The way prostitution is organised today, that many of the women actually live in the brothels, the pimps or the traffickers provide the accommodation uh, and they're moved around. So if they are to leave prostitution or get away from a trafficker, they need accommodation. And we have a resettlement worker and we help women access perhaps social welfare benefits and help women get counselling. So that's just touching on we are just some of our services. We have a whole broad range of services. We have counsellors. Um, and uh, out of the 258 women that we worked with last year, 71 of them were victims of sex trafficking. And as Sarah mentioned in her presentation, 32 of those women, uh, are, uh, sorry, the women, the 258 women came from 32 different nationalities. Um, we provide a lot of face-to-face -face work. It's time consuming uh, with women, but also uh, we would um, carry out um, support over the phone to women um, because sometimes, again, uh, if they're still involved in prostitution, they may not be able to travel to Dublin. So we try and help women access their services locally in, in the community, wherever they are. Um, overall, we would say that while there are some women who are in prostitution in Ireland who are independent, who are there and not wishing to be controlled by any <coughs> pimp or trafficker, they are a minority, and women that we are aware who are currently active in indoor prostitution tell us that probably that category of women in the sex trade, and this is an estimate, um, is maybe around 10%, that the majority, the overall majority of women in the sex trade are controlled by a third party. And even that 10% of women who are trying to remain independent, just there for themselves in indoor prostitution, they find it extremely difficult. Uh, often women contact us where they have received threats. Perhaps they are moving, for instance, from Dublin to perhaps someplace like Cavan, I'm just throwing it out as a name, perhaps it's in a wherever. 
and they will say that when they arrive in the particular town, they may either have a phone call or they will have someone visit them and threaten them and say, if you are going to come here, you are going to have to pay money to us. Uh, and there are other people, perhaps like landlords, who are exploiting women, women also and taking money. Uh, there are some uh, people also profiting from women in prostitution, where they are subletting um, premises to women and taking mon money from women. But it's not just taking the money. There's intimidation and there's threats and there's violence carried out. It's a very violent world. And we would say, as Sarah said in her presentation, you cannot separate sex trafficking from the whole prostitution, because it is within the sex trade that the trafficking occurs. And there are some pimps who will uh, have women who are victims of trafficking in a brothel with women who may not fit that narrow definition. So it, it is impossible to, to separate that side. So I, I hope that uh, answers some you, of I your question you and we can just... Definitely you know. I want the, an in-depth overview there. Um, can, can I ask uh, how much money on average uh, are a person in, in prostitution make from the sale of sex, uh, say in the Republic? And do you have any reason to believe that this figure would be lower or higher in Northern Ireland? Well, uh, I'm asking you for facts and figures today. Uh, I just don't know. Yes. You may not have them, but just with your work, uh, can you? Well, it, it, it depends on, on if a woman has access to the money. As we said, the majority of women, while they may be bought, I mean, we would know women who may have at least 10 or maybe more clients a day. So there's a lot of money passing through their hands. But if they have to pay, for instance, uh, for the premises, they have to pay, as I said, perhaps landlords who are exploiting these women in the sex trade by charging inflated rents. So they may be paying uh, and being exploited by these particular landlords. They may have a pimp. Uh, I suppose trafficking is the highest end of the exploitation that's happening in the sex trade. But there is lots of exploitation happening in the women. And women may have to hand over money, for instance, to the, those who advertise prostitution, they have to hand over money to. It really depends on whether she is being controlled and what level of control. And I suppose in our conversations with women, we're a support service, we're a social care, we deal with women's presenting needs. And um, we, don't, we don't query women on on how much, I suppose it's, it's not our, but no, the, the, those who profit from prostitution, it's in terms of in terms of looking at if you're looking at the baseline kind of in terms of going rates for the purchase of sex notwithstanding how that money gets distributed after it is handed over certainly um, you'd be talking about in the indoor sex trade in the region about 80 to 100 for a half an hour 180 maybe for an hour um, it really depends you, you can actually just check online but as Geraldine's saying how that money actually ultimately gets distributed once it's handed over um, really depends on street far far less um. but uh, I can just give you an example just thinking of one particular case and obviously if if a woman is highly controlled the people who control her want to make as much money out of out of that woman as possible so often those who are most controlled will end up having to have as many men buy them a day, then if a woman is more an independent, obviously she can pick and choose, and maybe if she only wants to have one client. But certainly, uh, just one particular case comes to mind. I know a woman who was a victim of trafficking, and she handed over to her trafficker and her pimp, because she had to divide it between the two, €8,000 a week, and she was handed back €20. Euro. Now, that particular woman worked as it, or I can't even call it work, but was exploited as a victim of trafficking in prostitution, both sides of the border. Um, and we would have heard uh, from investigations that were carried out on some victims of trafficking. Uh, and when you look across Europe, that actually the price of sex Ireland uh, on the island of Ireland was one of the highest. highest. So there's a huge profit to be made by pimps and traffickers on the island of Ireland. Compared to other countries in Europe, um, it was the most profitable. So obviously uh, we're an attraction 
uh, to criminals, and that's why I, I suppose we need to make it a cold climate for those who profit from prostitution. We need to have deterrence, and I suppose that's why we will support so much Clause 6, because it is a deterrent to the buyers. It will shrink the market, and it won't make it such an attractive place for pimps and traffickers, because obviously it, it has been. Uh, we know that um, not alone have we Irish pimps and traffickers operating on the island of Ireland, such as that particular case of uh, Thomas Joseph Carr, but there's also um, it's no longer a national issue. It's, it's a, a whole uh, <coughs> international criminal network that there are gangs who are actually living outside of the jurisdictions, but yet running the sex trade on the island of Ireland and threatening women very effectively. Um, I mean, we've seen women terrified of the phone calls they got because they knew that violence would be carried out if they didn't do what they were told. Yeah, you have mentioned there that pimps and the money they're making uh, in relation to uh, the, the prostitution. Uh, and you also work as the mobile nature of this uh, trade between uh, North and South. What is your experience? Would it be common for women to be controlled by pimps saying, moving from North to South or vice versa here uh, in this trade? And, and how, how much do you see it happening or increasing, say, into Northern Ireland? We'd have very close contacts with the guards, but we've also worked with the PSNI in relation to some cases. Um, we wouldn't have categoric figures as to the number who are operating both sides of the border. What I'd say is that there's absolutely no regard for the border. I mean, that goes also for anybody who's involved in the trade. We have a completely open border, and it, I mean, we just drove up here today, so it, you know, <laughs> there's no regard for protocol <laughs> uh, whatsoever. But there's definitively a number of cases which we are aware of where the, uh, 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 somebody may have started out operating in Dublin and, you know, perhaps Kildare and other areas, and we know definitively that they are operating in the likes of Belfast and other jurisdictions as well. Um, um, and, the, and the PSNI and Gardaí alike would be, would be aware of, of that happening. Um, so, it, yeah, definitively we would say that that is happening. Uh, it's happening right now, uh, but I couldn't give you exact numbers. Um, what I would say is that, as Geraldine said, there's a large degree of criminal organisation, but you're not talking about like one or two or three even big gangs. You are talking about dozens and dozens of some very large, very transnational operations extending from Eastern Europe or from Africa, where you have operations running across a number of different countries. And we would have worked with women who may have been trafficked in a number of different jurisdictions before they ended up in Ireland. Um, but then you also have some quite small opportunistic um, operations because we are considered a very lucrative market. The reason being that jurisdictions that like the likes of Germany, where you have, to use very bald economic terms, an absolutely saturated market um, because the thing has been legalised. So um, there's a very low risk, very high gain situation here. And you have uh, individuals, we've come across cases where you have, it's, it's, it's rarely just prostitution that the organisers might be involved in. They may use prostitution as a mechanism for money laundering. They may be also involved in drugs. Um, and, and yet it's actually a lower risk than running drugs. And so, um, you know, you're talking about quite a complex, it's, it's, it's quite a complex network. It's disparate. It's transnational. Um, and, uh, um, and, and it's right across the island. Charlene, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I okay, have a few questions here. Yeah. There a few more. Is there any other members at the stage? Ms. McCorley and Mr. Wells has indicated. Well, any, I'll come back to you. I'll bring in a few more oh, members. Okay. And we'll, we'll bring in Ms. McCorley. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, we, as you know, I mean, we do already have um, laws in place to address the whole human trafficking circumstances that you've outlined there, and I mean, we'd hope that those would be followed to um, to ensure the maximum outcome in terms of um, dealing with the whole issue of trafficking. Uh, but this uh, bill that we're talking about in Clause 6, which you know you specifically outline, um, makes one new aspect of law. So, given the circumstances that lead women into prostitution and, and people, whether it's men or women, um, 
How, how will this bill address those issues that affect those people, uh, so that if this were to be enacted, what, what way would it leave those people the following day, if, as is claimed, and I don't believe um, that the case has been proven, that this will uh, deter people? Uh, so, uh, in, in terms of human trafficking, so what would change for people if this law were enacted? How would it impact on them? OK, well, firstly, in relation to the law, I alluded earlier to the, the existing law, which um, where there is a criminal offence for the purchase of uh, a victim of trafficking. Um, and I know it's a strict liability offence. That is uh, an offence that carries, firstly, a life, uh, the potential for life imprisonment, which uh, actually makes it more problematic to police uh, in, in our observation, because because it has to be with a victim of human trafficking. Uh, you must therefore prove categorically a case of human trafficking. If because a life sentence is attached to that offence, the burden of proof on the state and on the police would be extremely high. Also, given the complexities of the sex trade and the difficulty to identify a victim of trafficking in the context of sex, uh, the sex trade, um, we would see that as an unworkable uh, law because the burden of proof is too high, um, and in the context of the sex trade, to prove that someone is definitively a victim of trafficking without having all of, the, without having the trafficker, without having the whole pathway, that it's not an effective deterrent. And to date, there have been no um, uh, convictions, uh, although I stand to be corrected, but I understand there have been no convictions in relation to that. As I say, Finland were the very first country to enact the same legislation, and they have now determined on independent evaluation that it has likewise been completely ineffective. If you have instead a much lower summary or similar offence for the purchase of sex to act as a deterrent, knowing that at best, you may have you know, a cohort of very vulnerable individuals. At worst, you have a victim of trafficking in the situation. And it is entirely fuelled by the demand to buy sex, which, as I said, is not a human right. It is something that is an indulgence on the part of a minority of individuals. That immediately hits out at the, uh, the incentive for those who organise prostitution to view this market as one in which to bring women in. because. Women are being brought in, There's very few Irish women proportionately in the sex trade, so there are pathways that have been created because there are opportunities here. So if pragmatically you're hitting the customer base of organised crime, um, it also creates an offence that is far more easy to police because the burden of proof and also the penalty, therefore, is much lower. It isn't about locking up people and throwing away the key for life. It is about simply creating a disincentive to do something which has the potential to be extraordinarily harmful to another human being. And at the same time, and I think we've said it, I think it's very important that for those in the sex trade, there are health services. And I understand, because I, I had a look at and I had some contacts with organisations in the north, that there are already existing you know, health services, there are sexual health services available, for instance, and, and there are support services there. We would, we would really welcome um, seeing the development of more uh, consolidated services that actually recognise those in prostitution as vulnerable persons and therefore support <coughs> exiting, where that's something that somebody wants to do. Um, and so for all those reasons, we would see this as a, a positive step forward to, to hit the trade, um, but also critically to reduce the continued and the increasing numbers that are actually coming into the sex trade. Um, because if we're not seen as a lucrative jurisdiction, the incentive goes. I'd give you an example. I worked in, um, on a case of a, a very young, a teenager, uh, over 18, but a teenager who had been trafficked from an Eastern European jurisdiction, and she had been a waitress. And uh, so she had a job. Uh, she was very well educated, but she had a vulnerability um, in that she had been isolated from her family. And so Somebody started chatting her up in that restaurant over a period of time, presented to her an opportunity to come and work as a childminder, have a bit of an adventure, come here, and, uh, and found herself, after four days of fun and out in the pub, finding herself up uh, in Sligo, trafficked. And very, very luckily, due to the vigilance of a reception staff in the hotel, actually was recovered um, and returned. What I would like to see is a situation where an opportunistic criminal isn't chatting up a waitress 
in a particular Eastern European country and that that's not happening. So that would be the... Yeah, and Eric, could I just add to that as well? The policing of Clause 6, we would hope, would be policed uh, following the Swedish example, that uh, it would be policed in the context of organised prostitution. Mm -hmm. So it would be following and, and following the places where it's known through surveillance and evidence that this is an organised network. And, and so if, if uh, the buyers are criminalised or, or acts as a deterrent, that means that those women who find themselves in those situations that are being controlled by organised criminals, uh, that they, because uh, the, we would estimate, and not just ourselves but also research internationally, that 90% of women who are in the sex trade actually want to leave but often cannot see a way out and many of them are entrenched or uh, are groomed or in some way held and intimidated by criminal gangs and if the trade is uh, reduced, if <coughs> it's policed in the context of organised prostitution, those women who find themselves trapped and if exiting support services are put in place, those women can be helped and this can be positive and, and certainly uh, we would welcome that uh, a policing approach that women who find themselves in the sex trade, that they're not criminalised, that further marginalises women because it gives them a criminal record uh, and uh, it also uh, allows the, the real criminals to get off the hook. So we would hope that it would be policed and that the impact would be on the organisers of prostitution, not the women themselves, and hopefully that along with this uh, support we put in place to those who want to get out. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I do, I do take your points, uh, but I, I don't see anything here which suggests that the comprehensive support structures which were put in place in Sweden to assist women, there's no evidence that that is going to be put in place here. The other bit that remains unconvincing for me is that people who would be involved in those sort of crimes you're talking about, organised prostitution, organised trafficking, I'm not sure somebody like that will be deterred by you know, a law which criminalises paying for sex. They're already involved in very serious criminality, which which makes me feel why would the why would they be concerned? But they they won't have buyers. They won't it's like any business, if 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 you've no customers your business goes bust. And we have actually seen ourselves on forums. There are, there are forums out there on the computer, uh, uh, on the internet, that uh, buyers actually talk to each other, of course, under pseudonames. And, and uh, because there's a lot of discussion, not just uh, in both jurisdictions in Ireland, but in France and many other countries are considering these laws, and we actually see buyers talk to each other, and they are saying, well, if this law is coming in, that's me finished. I have too much to lose because the profile, the average profile of the buyer is a middle class man with a good job and a relationship and a family. And most of them, it's, it's not the fine, it's not being thrown in jail that'll worry them, it's getting caught. And it's the deterrent and it's like any business and frame it within that. And we know it's like the drugs business, everything else, if there are no business, there's no buyers, uh, you have no market and, and there's no profit. Okay, okay, if that were the case, but when we were in Sweden, we were presented with evidence that actually the people working in, in the sex trade said that the, the buyers hadn't reduced, and in fact, whenever they ran an advertisement for 18-year-olds, they were inundated by thousands of requests of, of men wishing to purchase that. So the, the evidence, to me, is, is inconclusive. You, you can find evidence to support any case. But given all that, do you not think that we should be treating prostitution separately here rather than as a single clause in a human trafficking bill? In actual fact, while the, the two issues may be linked, in fact, they are linked, but they're still two separate issues. And I, I believe we should treat them separately. No, I suppose we disagree, and I, I, I won't comment too much because I know that our colleagues from the, the Turn Off the Red Light campaign will also be giving evidence, but the fact is, in relation to combating sex trafficking, you have to look at the laws relating to prostitution because if you, on the one hand, take the position that, for example, I'm not suggesting that, that you are taking that position, I understand that Sinn Féin actually also endorses the Turn Off the Red Light campaign, so uh, is that... Uh, if that prostitution is a job, that it is work, that all of those things are in place, you immediately uh, create a disparity in terms of how you might tackle sex trafficking. Because if you're going to regulate somewhere where 
uh, or regard some, an environment where uh, there is definitively you know, massive exploitation, one of the gravest human rights violations occurring, then you're creating a scenario where it's more difficult to police because, for example, in jurisdictions where it has been regulated, the police no longer have the authority to enter premises because they're <coughs> legitimate businesses. They must already have proof. Health services can only go in with the approval and agreement of the business owners. And we've seen uh, situations in the likes of Victoria and Australia where health service providers are going in, but they are required not to make any report of potential vulnerability of individuals who they think might be minors in the interest of providing harm reduction health care, and harm reduction health care is critical, but if that's the trade-off, then I think that's not the way to go. You must look at prostitution as an environment where exploitation fundamentally occurs, um, and it is predicated on a, a, a disparate uh, power dynamic. You have vulnerable individuals who very commonly don't have uh, other viable choices available to them who are, you know, without family supports, often carrying debt, and individuals who are buying sex who are simply using disposable income uh, in order to, you know, meet what they consider a need. But it's not a right. And so if sex trafficking is occurring in that environment, that harmful environment, it's incumbent on the state to look at the entire context as harmful and to legislate. But it really depends on what you want to achieve. You know, if you want to foster prostitution on the one hand, you know, um, that, that's the way to go. If you want to reduce the trade, reduce the size, but also socially <coughs> recognise that, you know, you have a vulnerable cohort who also need support, who need assistance, who need resources. In the Netherlands, nearly all funding for exiting models was cut after they introduced the legal regime. Um, you know, so it really depends what you want. We're, I suppose, given our view on that, but we would be categorical that you have to look at yeah. the two together. I think we, yeah, just yeah. in terms of prostitution, I think we just probably need to gather the evidence to look at what, what the picture is here in the North because we don't actually have that clear picture. So, uh, you know, I think we need, we need that information before we proceed. And also, we have worked with some women who entered the sex trade due to poverty or, or whatever particular situ situation of crisis or vulnerability. And actually, they wanted to be, we say, independent and so on, but they fell victim to trafficking, to traffickers. Mm -hmm. And vice versa, we had women who got away from the traffickers, but because the social supports weren't enough, then ended up in, in prostitution for themselves for a, a length of time. So uh, it, it's, you know, the, the line is, is very dim. You know, it, it's not a clear cut. It has to be addressed, uh, trafficking and prostitution. That's what, from our experience of women that are, are in the situation. Yeah. Well, that's a contest, too. Mr McCartney. Uh, thank you very much. It's just a follow on. For, you see, we're tasked here with, with bringing in a law, right? And do you want to be satisfied that it will do the intended desire of it? You know, so the law is in place in Sweden since 1999. And, and, and you know, looking for clear evidence that it has stopped the sex trade in Sweden is difficult to find. So therefore, you know, you can you can say, you know, and, and the logic of, you know, uh, tackling the man, you know, if you do away with the man, then there's no supply. I mean, is is a perfect theory. <clears throat> in a place that that it's that same, um, you know, until it's examined nearly as if they had done away with it by criminalising the purchase doesn't seem to be substantiated 14 years on. I don't think anyone has made the claim that prostitution will be completely eradicated, uh, neither trafficking, unfortunately, in just the same way that we legislate for rape and murder and drink driving and theft. Human beings, sadly, are deeply flawed individuals and there will always be those who will seek to exploit vulnerability who will have little regard for the law. But the fact is you need to have a law in order to at least set a benchmark um, and a standard by which you want your society to have due regard and, and care for vulnerable individuals. I do think that there is evidence, uh, particularly, as I say, when you compare with other jurisdictions, that the sex trade in Sweden is comparatively very small compared to other jurisdictions. Um, and likewise, at the same time, you have a normative effect, which is absolutely critical, where at the time of the enacting of the law, there was 40, I think, approximately 45 per cent support for the law. Now, there's over 70 per cent support for the law with younger people it's over 80% because you have an entire generation who have grown up with a law in place that says this is incompatible with equality. This is, you know, it is exploited. So those are the other 
positive knock-on effects that you have. So nobody is saying you'll get rid, but I do think there is evidence. And I mean, having been to Sweden also and, and met with the police and, and we're in kind of quite regular contact with the support services there, that um, there is a very clear uh, view that firstly you shrink the trade enough that the police can actually be resourced to try and effectively combat the persistent criminality that prevails um, because, again, looking at other jurisdictions where you have a legal and regulated trade that the police are saying that they can't manage, you equally have a completely parallel and uh, unquantified but estimated much larger illegal trade. So the police are just not at the races in terms of trying to tackle it in jurisdictions where it's been regulated. So all what we're saying is that it's highly pragmatic to try and minimise the degree of exploitation so that mm -hmm. the police, with the resources they have, can actually effectively target. And I, I find it curious that sometimes Sweden gets, it gets thrown out that they have a successful trafficking case. We haven't got a conviction in the Republic of Ireland okay. in our own legislation for trafficking. They have it because they are effectively resourced to police the trade that is there, and the trade is not so big that they can't do it. So I suppose pragmatically we would say that there is evidence that it's effective in that respect. I, I, but it doesn't, it doesn't come at you. I mean, mm. even you know, reading through your submission, mm. I mean, there's no sort of say that uh, at one time in Sweden, here was the size of the trade, <coughs> now it's, oh, now it's yeah. in size. Oh, so we, I mean, the only reference is a social worker and an outreach mm. service, and reading her commentary, mm. I think there's an acceptance. It's at least the same, if not. So I, I, I don't read from, from the evidence that, mm. that she's saying that in Stockholm it has made a massive change. Well, the police have said that they, it has shrunk. They have also said that they have wiretap evidence to, to indicate that traffickers are literally saying Sweden is a real hassle. Um, you know, um, so don't go there. And of course, you may have some who persist in it. So, I mean, our submission wasn't solely to make the case for Sweden. It was more rather we, we took the approach that as a frontline service operating on the island of Ireland that we would share our experience and make allusion to. But um, as I say, it's not for any jurisdiction to literally uh, parachute in the legislation of another jurisdiction, but to you know, uh, take a position as to what approach they would like to take, what outcomes they would like, and, and legislate according to the jurisdiction. Jim Wells? Um, we were in Sweden and uh, had a very intensive session with the Swedish authorities, uh, and they answered this, I thought, very, very well, but I think it's a point that keeps coming up time after time after time, that uh, classics will drive prostitution underground, it will make women more vulnerable, it will make the authorities less able to find out if there's abuse or trafficking or whatever. And <clears throat> we hate to keep asking that question, but it seems to be those who oppose this bill that that's the main plank of their argument. Now, I know you've been asked this question by myself before in a different jurisdiction, but what, what's your view on that? Um, well, I suppose the, the, the definitive one is that prostitution will always, to a certain degree, be underground because it will never not be associated with criminality. That's never not going. You're never going to have a utopian situation where prostitution is run by, you know, former car salesmen and florists. It's always going to be the people who are running it illegally in the first place. So it's always going to have a degree of uh, operating in the shadows. It also, in any jurisdiction, has a degree of stigma attached to it, uh, and that includes jurisdictions where you know attempts have been made to regulate it. And so, it will always happen, certainly quietly, uh, in certain corners and places. However, it is a demand-driven; it is a, a market, and therefore, if buyers can find those who they wish to access in prostitution, it is quite pragmatic and practical to say that the police with the correct resources that others you know who seek to look will find it um, and so it's never going to be above ground so to speak but legislating in this fashion is not going to drive it any further underground it is already very difficult to in certain 
categories to you know, identify and access where prostitution is happening. What you need to do is try and shrink the trade in order to allow better resources, better focused resources to try and actually target that small trade that's there. And I suppose, I suppose at the risk of being repetitive in jurisdictions where they regulate it, they have recognised that they have an entire parallel illegal trade and they have no idea what's going on in that. Um, There's a more subtle variation of that argument that if you make it illegal to purchase sexual services, then the men, and of course, unfortunately, the vast majority of people here are men, are much less likely to report <coughs> uh, apparently trafficked women, women who have been abused, been mm. neglected, or who have been trafficked. That, that up to now, these men have felt reasonably free to come forward and give their evidence to the police because they themselves are unlikely to be criminalised. Mm. Under the Clause 6, they will automatically lead themselves up for prosecution if they come forward with that information. Well, they can still do that. Crime stoppers. It's one eight hundred. We get people yeah. contacting us quite anonymously, and, and all we need, and all the police, as far as we can see, <coughs> need is that that information. We're talking about a summary offence here, the Clause Six, uh, and and uh, like in. in in Ireland, under, in the Republic of Ireland, under the Criminal Law Human Trafficking Act of 2008, uh, it is a criminal offence to buy sex from a trafficked woman. Yet, we have witnessed buyers who have contacted either ourselves or Gardaí. There are ways and means where that buyer is never identified, never found. So uh, it doesn't stop, uh, but very few buyers mm. actually report. There are some who do report. Um, concerns that the girls are young or she looks upset. But the percentage that do that compared to the percentage of men who bought that same woman is huge. I mean, we worked with women who are victims of traffic and who maybe one man tried to help them get away, but they had to have sex with 20 men a day who didn't mind the fact that she was cold, tired, crying, was totally non-interested. We even see reviews on the escort uh, site that gives out if a woman is not enjoying it or she's just very functional or whatever, or she looks young. So some men see the indicator, see the signs and don't report. So they're not the big priority area of reporting and identifying and finding victims of trafficking anyway. And for those who may look into the eyes of a woman or really care and see that there is a woman here and a woman who could be in need, um, they, they can still report, even this, and we see it, and people contact Ruhama, um, we've, we've had people, men, who contact Ruhama, on, and we pass that information on to the guards, or we know that people can contact Crime Stoppers or, or whatever. But uh, we must remember the transaction, uh, for a lot of buyers, they are buying sex they are buying a service and from what we understand from listening to the women, they come in and they buy a service and they don't, and most of them don't really care because if one really cared, the indicators of some women are screaming at you, but they, they don't really care. So they're, they're, not, they're not the cohort, but buyers are not the big cohort who are going to identify victims of trafficking from our experience mm. and, and from the evidence that's shown. Mm. Yeah, in fact, I think we put a, a few in the appendix actually just to show the, you know, the the lack of compassion on the part of some buyers where all they had to do was pick up the phone anonymously and say, I think this person's in trouble here. Um, you know, and yet instead they actually gave a bad review to warn other sex buyers that they might not have a good time with this person. And so, um, and to give another example, just in terms of while on the one hand, sometimes those who are trafficked um, fit that very stereotypical picture of somebody who's in a state of distress, somebody who may be, you know, uh, quite clearly coerced, who may have evidence of maybe physical abuse, there's a large cohort that don't because the mechanisms of trafficking um, uh, vary and can be quite subtle and it can be more around uh, the degree of threat or debt that are being levelled against women. And to give you an example in relation to buyers, there was one case which was prosecuted outside of this jurisdiction where you had a very large, very um, comprehensive criminal network which included trafficking and organised prostitution which operated among other jurisdictions within Ireland and one of the women who was the most reviewed woman 
on the main uh, escort website turned out to be a victim of trafficking uh, and coercion as a, as a part of that gang, um, most reviewed woman, so had seen countless men. And the hand wringing and, you know, uh, you know, self pity and you know the, the guilt expressed on the on the, the forums thereafter was fascinating. And oh, I never knew. And if I had known, and yet interestingly, knowing that they had bought a victim of sex trafficking and had not known and had not had the means because she presented such a clear facade as being an independent sex worker, the majority of these guys are still buying sex and still posting reviews. And so, I would question the degree of self-reflection uh, or, or um, uh, care um, on the part of sex buyers. Uh, as Geraldine was saying, they're not going to represent the largest cohort of but those who But anyone can set up an anonymous email account, send an email, mm. close it down, shut it, and report something. And, and we, we get those kind of emails, and, and we know other people too. So they won't be criminalised, you know. You described the average uh, purchaser of sex as sort of, uh, middle class, often married family partner. Um, but some of the industry would tell us that they actually have a sort of a social service where they're providing sexual service for instance to severely disabled people or people with learning difficulties or who are unlikely ever to find a, a partner in life or get married. Uh, so therefore it, it's a social service that's meeting a need. Now, um, is that, from your evidence, have you found many sex workers who are providing for that need? No, I've asked, actually, because this has come up before, and I think, actually, I, and I won't say that what is critically important, and, and I think it's um, of great benefit that the committee are going to be hearing not only from those who are, you know, uh, actively currently involved in the, um, in the sex trade, but also those who are survivors, um, because they have an extraordinarily valuable voice and insight to, to lend to this. So I would have spoken to quite a few women who've exited um, and asked them that very direct question of, in the number of years that you've been in prostitution, how many men with a disability might you have seen? And I do recall one woman who was uh, in for seven years, so that maybe twice, but once the guy was just on crutches because you think he broke his leg or something like that. So you're talking about a tiny cohort, a very tiny cohort, and I, I spoke with the disability activist there not that long ago in relation to this very question, and he, as a disabled man who's an activist uh, in the field in terms of uh, support and, and rights for, for uh, those living with disabilities, felt that it was deeply insulting uh, to people with disabilities um, to kind of argue that, you know, there are certain people who are never going to get it any other way because the, it, what it does is it's kind of suggesting that, that it is, you know, not possible for some people who live with disability to actually foster meaningful um, relationships and intimacy with other individuals. And, um, and again, another project which I, I was chatting with where they actually paid for um, somebody with a disability to interestingly travel out of this jurisdiction uh, to, um, to have uh, paid sex because he was a virgin, because he wanted to. But he came back and he complained. Um, and his complaint was that the woman wouldn't kiss him. Um, and they were saying, well, no, it, it was about the sex. But actually, it wasn't. It was about the intimacy. And you just can't buy intimacy. Um, you know, human companionship and, and you know, all of those things are extremely valuable to, to foster a sense of culture and society and, and, and self-esteem. But buying sex is an illusion of that. And it doesn't actually create a fulfilling intimacy because it's a transaction that involves money. Um, but I think the key thing is that it, I would feel this really tends to be thrown out as a red herring. It is such a tiny cohort uh, of individuals. And finally, and it's useful that you're here because you've experienced it both Northern Ireland and the Republic. What would be the implications if Northern Ireland went down this route and accepted the entire bill, including Clause 6, and the Irish Republic didn't? I think that there'd be quite a few men from the north who might be trucking down to Dublin, and that would be a matter for the authorities in, uh, you know, in, in that jurisdiction to deal with. What we would like to see is that there's an extraordinary opportunity for both jurisdictions to act in tandem, as it were, notwithstanding its different potential pieces of legislation, to create a very strong all-Ireland message and approach to this particular but issue. Are we anywhere near that in the Republic? Oh, yeah. Well, the Joint Directors Committee in Dublin have uh, published a unanimous uh, recommendation 
to enact a, a piece of legislation to criminalise the purchase of sex and ensure that those... And did that include all parties? That is a unanimous cross-party and including in Sinn Féin. And also, again, just around, uh, if you want to hear the voice of buyers, again, uh, reading forums that the buyers okay, write on, uh, when they heard about particularly the Republic of Ireland considering this, they were saying, that's me heading to Newry. Literally, that's exactly the echo and was, I'll be going to Newry. So um, that's um, the, the reality if, if one jurisdiction, I think, moves it in, that it will move the trade and it will move then those who, who profit and organise the trade. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Elliott. Chair, thank you, and thanks very much for your presentation. <coughs> Query just around uh, the proposal to decriminalise sex for the, um, for the person. Do you see that as being abused in any way, or attempted to be abused particularly, um, in a sense that people would indicate that they have, that they're forced into selling sex? Sorry, I'm just wondering if it's that position, if, if you decriminalise the issue of selling sex, mm -hmm. could that be abused in any sense? It's just a question. Um, I, don't, I don't envisage that because those who are involved in prostitution tend to be extraordinarily discreet, generally speaking, in, in terms of their, um, what their actions are. It came up, uh, interestingly, as, as, as a question in the hearings in the Joint Eroctus, is like, is there potential for blackmail or anything like that? But actually, our experience is that that would, almost, that would never be the case. The one area where we have seen evidence that somebody might have been um, you know, seeking to exploit that particular avenue is the one particular uh, pimp called uh, Tony Leland? Yeah. Had uh, cameras, you know, uh, in, Cork, in this happened in uh, in smoke detectors, in plugs, things like that, and was monitoring and recording everything, which gave him scope to blackmail not only the women but also the buyers. But I, I wouldn't envisage that it, it would. Um, I think what it is really important in relation to that is rather to. Um, Consider that, and unfortunately, we've had the experience where we've we've actually met. We have a referral relationship with the women's prison in Dublin, where we have gone in and met with a woman who is in on a conviction of brothel keeping, who was a victim of trafficking. And so, it is absolutely critical that those in prostitution are not criminalised, because you're potentially criminalising somebody literally for the worst kind of exploitation. So, um, no, I don't see. And, and most uh, women who find themselves in prostitution, as you say. Uh, their entry, uh, it was a backdrop of perhaps poverty, debt, background of abuse, positions of vulnerability. Uh, and if they are criminalised while in prostitution, it only further marginalises mm. the women. Uh, and it also, as I said, gets the, um, the criminals off the hook. There is uh, an easy supply of women for pimps and traffickers, and we've seen situations where women were arrested. Sometimes they... Uh, so if you decriminalise it, will there not be an easier flow of women then available? No, well, if, if, if the woman is arrested and charged, and uh, quite a lot of times what happens in the Republic of Ireland, they're asked to leave the, the country, well, there goes the evidence. And also it, it uh, breaks uh, the relationship of trust with a woman in prostitution and the law enforcement agency because they're afraid to come forward. Then if she feels that she will not be criminalised, uh, law enforcement agencies uh, are much more likely to get intelligence. And we know this for a fact because there are a number of operations by Angar the Shikana where they have taken the approach not to, um, to criminalise women in prost street prostitution in particular. We had uh, an operation uh, in the north inner city in Dublin and also an operation in Limerick. Uh, and uh, the result of that is where Gardaí will get a lot of intelligence, where women will begin to trust, mm. and where, if you want to catch the big fish, uh, it's there, the focus, and, and uh, Ruhama for the last uh, three years is involved in Garda training, and we also train the PSNI in the whole issue of uh, policing prostitution and being sensitive to the needs of, of women. And very much we're delighted that on Garda Shikana at a senior level um, is mandating an approach very much not to arrest or criminalise uh, women. Now, in practice, that doesn't always work out, uh, and we're 
still, I suppose, uh, working along with the Gardaí and trying to influence policy that, um, that women who are in the sex trade are not criminalised. It doesn't help the issue of organised prostitution and sex trafficking. Uh, neither does it incentivise women to go into prostitution. I think that it is the exact opposite, it is in jurisdictions where it is the criminalised, not just those in prostitution, but that the whole structure and systems are decriminalised. That acts, as I mentioned, the uh, situation in New Zealand uh, where 25% of those interviewed entered because it had become decriminalised, therefore it was more normalised. Okay. You know, when we were, uh, and I, I went to Sweden, um, they indicated that before their law there was <coughs> around 2,000 Swedish women were involved in prostitution. Now there's 500, mm. and, and that was a mark of the reduction that had taken place. Well, one of the other points that was made was because there wasn't um, the, the criminalisation anymore of the women that was involved, uh, whenever they had uh, identified an individual who had purchased sex, over 90% of the women involved provided a witness statement, which then they could use in order to secure a conviction. And that, to me, was a demonstration of a change in the system when you build up the relationship and the trust. Um, is that something that you think would be applicable here in this jurisdiction, that that, that change um, would facilitate women to feel at liberty, uh, to provide evidence rather than face prosecution? Yes, and, and in practice it is happening in some districts in the Republic of Ireland. As some, uh, we certainly know the, um, there's a particular unit uh, uh, dealing with organised prostitution and they certainly, their strategy and their approach, because their focus is organised prostitution, is not in any way to criminalise those who find themselves uh, prostitutes. Uh, it's often, uh, I don't like saying it, lazy policing because there's just fantastic officers out there and we know in both jurisdictions on a daily basis policing, but I suppose the easy targets uh, when a police officer enters a brothel is the women that's there found. They are the easy targets to be arrested. Uh, in practice, what sometimes can happen, and, and I lived in South Belfast here in the red light district, I know what it's like for residents to have prostitution on their doorstep. It's not comfortable. In practice, often what happens is residents complain, prostitution is happening in the apartment beside us or on the street, we have children, we don't want... And, you know, there's busy police officers, there's a lot of areas police, and they go out and go into a brothel. The person you see is the woman there in front of you and arrest, close up the brothel and job done. And I suppose we would uh, recommend, and, and certainly from our conversations with senior members of Angarda Shikana and from some conversations with senior members of PSNI, that uh, the focus needs to be much more on the organised crime and arresting and prosecuting those women is not the answer, that it's going after um, the, 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 the major players and actually by criminalising this soft target there, it is not helpful. You're losing the evidence. I mean, we know women who were told to leave the country and then months later investigations undercover that those women would have been you know, victims of serious crime, and, but now they've gone back home and nobody knows where they are. And well, th there has been some commentary from the police here that uh, if we decided to change the law, it would make it more difficult for them to tackle this problem. Um, what has been the attitude of Angarda Shikana in terms of the move that the, uh, the, the change in the law would present there? Are, are they indicating that they wouldn't be able to, to effectively police this? I'd want to be careful because the guard, they haven't given a formal position. Um, I, uh, we, we have, we work very positively at a high level with Angarda Shiakona. I think what is critical is that there has been a, a, a real sea change in the last five years, at least anyway, to um, take a more compassionate regard for those in the sex trade. Um, and that is a signal that rather than treating it as a public order offence or simply, you know, shut it down and move them on, that they are looking at it in, in a more um, uh, a broad fashion uh, and that their objective would be to, to tackle organised crime. I think um, there's an issue of resourcing um, and, uh, and, and what would be helpful is 
that they continue to work, as some are, in relation to building relationships with those who are actually active in prostitution through what we call welfare visits, that kind of thing. Um, so I can't really... I, I, we would have conversations with the Gardaí. We have had some very positive um, commentary, you know, to the effect where individuals... So I, I want to be clear, I'm not stating a guard. The position individuals would have said that they would recognise that the degree of organised crime that is prevalent would be hit um, by such a move, um, just even from the deterrent, the immediate deterrent uh, of, of creating a piece of law. There are certainly... There's a whole cohort of, of buyers who just don't want to break the law. That's it, you know. So that has been acknowledged by individuals, but I haven't, they haven't a policy. What I'd also say, though, what's very interesting, having spoken and met with um, Swedish uh, and Norwegian police, but particularly the Swedish police, is that the Swedish police thought it wouldn't work and thought it would be really difficult and were quite opposed to it. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the police are there to enact the law as it stands and to find mechanisms to, to adapt and work around that, and that, that has proved effective. Um, and one of the greatest advocates of that legislation now would be one of the police inspectors uh, within the Swedish prostitution unit, who himself would say that he just didn't see it working at all in the first instance. So I think the proof is in yeah. the trying of it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to try and wrap this up. Sure. I'm conscious with another number of sessions. So Mr Lynch um, is the last one in this session and then we'll move on. Thanks, Joe. <coughs> Just a quick question. When you said that those very few Irish women involved in the trade, how many is involved in the trade across the end of Ireland? What's the makeup? Well, I suppose it's very hard to say uh, a definite figure because also um, women can be in prostitution for a couple of days a week. They could be uh, in prostitution uh, for a couple of months, and just, you know, it's a transient population anyway. But uh, Monica O'Connor, who I know is going to be part of the next presentation, I think that she will probably yeah. speak more about that because uh, she um, was one of the researchers in a piece of research carried out a couple of years ago by the Immigrant Council of Ireland in partnerships with ourselves and the Women's Health Service. And they estimated that on any one day there was up to a thousand women for sale on the island of Ireland. But I know that Monica may be able to, to elaborate more on that. Okay. Okay, well, can I thank you both very much for coming to the committee? <coughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, members, we'll just go straight into the next um, evidence session. So, if members of the turn off the red light, do you want to come forward? The uh, relevant there's a written submission on page 62 and 63 for members' benefit. So again, let me just formally welcome um, the team from Turn Off the Red Light, and um, I welcome Claire Mahon. 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 Get one of them right. <laughs> um, he's president of Irish Nurses and Midwives Organisation. Uh, Monica O'Connor, <coughs> researcher and activist on trafficking and sexual exploitation. John Cunningham, chair of the board of the Immigrant Council of Ireland, and uh, Jerry O'Connor, communications manager of the Immigrant Council of Ireland. To the meeting, um, you're all very welcome. Uh, again, we appreciate you taking the time out to help us in our deliberations on this particular uh, issue. So I'm going to hand over to yourselves. And then members, I'm sure, will have some questions. Thank you, Chair. And on behalf of the Toronto Red Light campaign, I thank you and the members of the committee for having us here today. Uh, so what struck me immediately as I was sitting on the back was that it is a great point of progress, as far as I'm concerned, that this conversation is taking place at all. And when I look back at when we started our involvement in this process, let me tell you, we had more questions than we had answers for. And it's taken us quite a journey to get to a point where there's a, I suppose, a coordinated sense of what we're doing right now. Um, I suppose very quickly, the Toronto Red Light I'm chair of the Immigrant Council of Ireland, and maybe very quickly, we're an organisation, an NGO that uh, defends the rights and entitlements of immigrants living in Ireland. And as part of our ongoing service delivery, we were identifying over time women and girls as young as 14 who have been trafficked into Ireland for the sex trade. And at the time when we looked to see what we could do about this, we lived in an environment where there was an absolute denial that trafficking was taking place and that this really was something that was a bit of a myth. So we actually carried out a very important piece of independent research that definitively proved that trafficking did take place and it was directly linked to the sex trade and criminality. And as, a result of, as a result of that, 
an awful lot of uh, developments have taken place since. The Trinofa like campaign uh, is a coalition of over 68 organisations, OK? And I suppose I think what's really quite, a, quite extraordinary in that context is that the 68 organisations represent over 1.6 million people living in the South. And they are from the unions to farming organisations to youth organisations. Um, to other NGOs, business representatives, trade union movements, academics, human rights. It's a very, very broad church. And I think the 1.6 million figure is one that, again, gives us great, uh, I suppose, encouragement with the Garth work that we're doing. And certainly from a political point of view in the South, having an organisation that represents 1.6 million people gets attention. Um, I think also it's really important to just to create that context, the Toronto like campaign put forward the, 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 the recommendation for the criminalisation of men buying sex because the belief was that the demand was the way in which to deal with it. And again, we've had so many detailed debates in trying to get our heads around, is this the right thing to do? What else, what other options are there available to us? And we believe that fundamentally it is the right thing to do. We have secured unanimous backing from uh, a cross-party Oireachtas Justice Committee who have recommended to the Minister of Justice that this law be enacted. So that recommendation has been passed into the doll, and uh, Minister Shatter is currently reviewing that piece of legislation. We have the four parties, Sinn Féin, Labour, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, in direct support of what we're doing, and three of those organisations, Sinn Féin, Labour and Fianna Fáil, have signed up uh, constitutional support in their own uh, parliamentary parties at their own uh, conferences. Um, and we have 22 local councils across Ireland supporting it. And, you know, it gives us again that sense that we have this very, very broad level of support for what we're trying to do. Um, I think that what's really important today is that, one, you as a committee get to ask as many questions as possible. I think that our colleagues from Raham have given a very clear view of a lot of the issues. Uh, what I'd like to do now is just to kind of to spark that kind of conversation uh, is to. Uh, invite uh, Monica O'Connor just to again give a little insight into uh, her experience, her work to date, and again to try and inform this discussion so that we get the best out of it. Monica. Thank you, John. Um, you know, I suppose Sarah and Geraldine have actually covered a lot of the broader issues, but I was struck by you know, the discussion in relation to research and evidence. Um, my background is I've spent the last seven years researching and looking at the evidence. And I, and I took your point about what is the research base and what is the evidence out there. And really, I just wanted to very briefly go back to the, the core issue, really, in relation to evidence of the different policy and legislative approaches to the issue of prostitution and trafficking for sexual exploitation. Um, and I suppose really at this stage, we are 10 years on, we have, a, I would think, overwhelming evidence and research indicating two very different approaches and the failure and effectiveness of both of those approaches. And I think this is a unique opportunity. We have a unique opportunity in Ireland now, um, in these two jurisdictions, probably to learn from that evidence. Um, so what I would say is, you know, the, the first approach is to see a rigid demarcation between trafficking for sexual exploitation and prostitution and arguing that these are two separate issues and we should have not have an integrated bill, as you're suggesting here with Clause 6. Um, that is based on the assumption, I suppose, that the state differentiates between a legitimate demand to have women and girls available for, sexual, for sex and for, for sale, really, um, on the one hand, as opposed to those who are trafficked into the country. Um, I think just very clearly, I'd just like to say this is probably the most implemented in Holland, in the Netherlands. And ten years ago, that's the approach they took. They took the idea of desirable. I mean, their law actually states we need to differentiate between desirable prostitution and undesirable prostitution. And by undesirable, they really believed, and I think these are a lot of the arguments that come up from the sex workers' perspective, that you can create a rigid demarcation between coercion and force, pimping, children, underage, organised crime, and in particular, trafficking. And that you can, in some way, police and regulate a sector 
such as the sex sector, in such a way that that approach from a policy and legislative approach works and is effective. So on the one hand, you have very strong, for example, in the Netherlands, very strong anti-trafficking legislation, a massive infrastructure to tackle trafficking and coercion and pimping. And on the other hand, therefore, you have a very clear legal regime. So I'm going to just give some of the figures that have resulted. And this is the evaluation done by the Dutch government themselves. This is an extensive evaluation by Dalder in 2007. And really, this is the evidence we need to be looking at, not just the Swedish approach, but this is where certainly in the South we're headed, with a tolerance regime on the one hand of prostitution and on the other hand very strong anti-trafficking measures, which in fact are totally ineffective, as we've seen and as Sarah said. So where are they now, 10 years on in Holland? And I'll just give you some sectors. In the legal sector, you now have 25,000 people in prostitution, primarily women and young, young, very young women. And that's in the legal sector. Now, the National Rapporteur on Trafficking and the evaluators have both said they have no estimates, and the police would agree this, of the illegal sector. And in that illegal sector, we have non-location ban premises, escort agencies, internet prostitution, none of it being policed, and in fact, the Dutch police would say it's not policeable. What about trafficking? In that, in that 10 years, the Dutch figures are overwhelming. They are talking now of between 900 and 1,000 victims of trafficking a year that they are actually identifying, and that's given that they have no, no policing of the illegal sector. Pimping is widespread, and remember, there's always a relationship between the legal sector and the illegal sector. Um, one of the worrying things in the research is that you have 18-year-old girls, for example, coming to the legal brothels with their birth certificates <coughs> on their 18th birthday to enter the brothel. Now, obviously, the evaluators and researchers know that those girls didn't suddenly appear. They have been in prostitution for many years within the illegal sector. I do accept that some people had real, a lot of concerns in Holland in relation to this, and I accept those concerns, are for the health and well-being of women. That was part of the rationale, well, we can police this sector. I think academics, researchers in Holland are very clear. This is not a sector that's amenable or open to regulation. It is not a sector that is going to allow inspection. Actually, the mental health indicators now in Holland are far lower for women in prostitution than they were prior to this legislation. And as Sarah said, only 6% of the municipalities in uh, the Netherlands have actually implemented the exit routes. So that's, you know, in a way I think it's worth, it's always look, worth looking at where we would be heading without this law. <coughs> Um, and I certainly, I was part of the research in the South and, you know, as Sarah was saying, you know, we're talking at this stage of at least a thousand women in prostitution and we have one and we have very robust legislation in relation to trafficking and we've got not a single effective prosecution in relation to many areas of that prostitution law. So far we've had 16. I would say, talking to the Department of Justice even a couple of months ago, the vast majority of those cases under the trafficking law could have been prosecuted under Child Sexual Exploitation Act of 2000 and under other sexual offences acts. Um, he would say we probably have between one and three even cases in relation. And that is with a massive in infrastructure of trafficking legislation with all the intentions, as you had said, of putting in a very strong, robust piece of legislation. It is ineffective in tackling, as we have talked about, the demand. So what is another approach? And I think with, in regards to Sweden, I would just like to mention some figures because people have been talking about, you know, is the evidence there? Well, the evidence, as you said, Chair, is that 600 women, and these are the evidence from academics and researchers and from the Eurostats. These are not an opinion, and I think there are a lot of opinions in relation to this issue, but I would strongly urge people to look at the evidence. So 600 women are in prostitution in Sweden with a population of 9 million. Now, compared to Denmark, 5.6 million population, 5,500 women in prostitution that are visible within prostitution. In Norway, over 3,000 people in prostitution. So if you do comparative figures across the Scandinavian countries and the Nordics, what you're seeing very clearly is further evidence of the, the effectiveness of the Swedish approach. 
the, the, and I would draw your attention to two other papers that I think would be helpful to the committee. The International Labour Organization has just published two uh, papers by economists, which are clearly demonstrating one very simple fact. There is a direct correlation between scale and percentage. So in other words, the higher you allow the sex industry to grow, the bigger the scale of trafficking. It's a very simple, now the paper isn't simple, it's an economic paper and they've worked out all of the correlations and figures. But the International Labour Organization does not take a position on prostitution. These are two independent papers, both of whom are saying if you allow the sex industry to grow, you are allowing trafficking for sexual exploitation to grow. It's very simple in that sense. Finally, I suppose I just wanted to say in relation to the role of the state, um, I think one of the difficulties of trying to separate out prostitution and trafficking is that you are focusing the responsibility of the state to protect the human rights of a certain group of women and girls. So you're saying, in effect, with the legislation in the South and trafficking, it is illegal, it is unacceptable to buy these girls and women. But by implication, by introducing legislation that leaves out a Clause 6, that in fact doesn't introduce a specific clause that addresses prostitution. You are by implication, and for the first time in the South, we now have it in law, enshrined in law, that it is all right, it is legal to buy sex from all these girls and women. Now, I have just interviewed Irish women in prostitution, migrant, migrant women, and trafficked women. But I've interviewed over 30 women over the last few years. And I have to say, differentiating the level of violation of bodily and sexual integrity in terms of state responsibility across those girls and those women is really unacceptable. I mean, I have interviewed young Irish homeless girls, 15 are, are women that were in it from the time they were 15, young women from Moldova and young women from Nigeria. From my perspective, I suppose, as a researcher, I would, and I've examined a lot of the different state structures, I think the responsibility of the state is to address all that, not just to differentiate in terms of voluntariness or consent. Um, so I suppose I'd be urging that people, and I have ample you know, reports and evidence, obviously, and research, but I really would stress that we are 10 years on than, you know, in 2000, where we do have evaluations, we do have research, and we have a body of evidence that's indicating all of those things to us. Thank you very much. I just pick that point up, and then yeah. um, I think you're inviting us to now ask. Thank you. Um, are men not different, but here than they are in Sweden? Um, are men different in the south yeah. or the north? Both. <laughs> Sorry. In both jurisdictions. <laughs> we're probably we're probably not too dissimilar to people in the Irish Republic here in Northern Ireland. <laughs> 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 I'm not sure about that question, but anyway, um, well, my son was saying, I, I, I don't know, I have a 34-year-old son who said to me about this, you know, that yes, one thing he does notice, he's a couple of very good Swedish friends, and he would say that over the past 10 years, there has been a shift, and I think one really, and I'm coming to the north and south in relation to men here, is that we have to remember the Swedish law was declarative. It was normative. That was the primary role. It wasn't punitive in its primary role. It was a declarative law. It was saying it was normative. It was saying to young men, this is not acceptable. It's not acceptable to buy a girl or woman. It is acceptable to negotiate adult consensual sex. So I would say that has permeated society in a sense, much more than the punitive aspect of it, although I think that's absolutely essential because it's a deterrent. But I absolutely would say that we can change minds by the law. So would I say men in the north and south, no, they're not different. I mean, buyers are definitely the figures internationally demonstrate that the more the industry grows and the more the industry becomes normative, more men will see it and young men will see it as more acceptable to buy, yes. Mm -hmm. So if you allow the industry to grow in the north and in the south as it has, it does become more normative and it does become more acceptable, yeah. It does. <coughs> yeah. Mr Wells. Um, I'm intrigued about uh, how all-embracing your organisation is in the Republic. Uh, you're saying you've got the full support of all the mainstream political parties. Are you, when you say that, do you mean are they in membership of the turn-off? Uh, three of the political parties, Fianna Fáil, Labour and Sinn Féin, 
motions have been passed by delegates at their conferences. Um, in terms of Fine Gael, it is the Fine Gael members of the Justice Committee have unanimously backed the, uh, the, the law, the recommendation for the law. Um, the only reason there hasn't been a vote in Fine Gael is that an opportunity hasn't arisen. There is an ordash planned ahead of the elections, the local and European elections, and it's our intention to have a motion down there. But were all of the main parties represented on the Oireachtas Committee? Yes, and independents. There were no abstentions made no, the main No, it was party. unanimous, unanimously agreed by both independents and members of parties. Yeah, because that, I don't suspect we, we're going to have the same consensus up here, but it's intriguing that, that the parties who are represented on both sides of the border may have a different view. What side of the board well, I'm, sure, I'm sure the members of the, the, the committee in the South will sympathise with the body of work you have to do. Uh, I mean, they reached their decision on the back of 800 written submissions and six months of hearings. Well, th th one, of the, one of the arguments put forward is that uh, we had such a classic uh, way of getting rid of something is we need more research. We need to have a committee to go off and do, collect the stats. And we can't introduce such a sweeping change in legislation without hard facts and studies and long-term uh, investigations. Was that the view of any of the mainstream parties in the Republic before they backed uh, the Turn Off the Red Light campaign? Uh, certainly when we went um uh, the, the turn off the red light campaign didn't go per se to um, the oral hearings in the South. Members were invited individually. I can only speak for when the Immigrant Council uh, made its um, submission, and that wasn't an issue that arose. No. Okay. Could it be yeah, that? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, just in terms of research, I mean, I would worry that it is a weight cake to touch. Uh, you know, I'm a real believer in research, and I'm committed to it. But I think it can be a failure to act, and I think it can be a failure of courage, because really there is ample evidence. And I think it does come back to that question. Are we saying you know, that we need 10 more years of research or are we willing to actually look at the evidence that's there? I would agree. I think it's really helpful to maybe get a good presentation of the evidence that's there. Um, and certainly in terms of the effectiveness of different legislative <coughs> frameworks, I would think that's critical for the deliberations in the South. I mean, I addressed the Joint Directors Committee in the South um, and the Senate, and in both cases I think it was critical that all the members had access to the body of evidence that's there, also because it gave them confidence that this law is implementable, it's effective, and that it's workable. Um, and I think without that evidence people can feel unsure, and one of the things they say is, well, we need more research. Whereas actually, I think first of all, is to gather all that evidence, really. But at any stage, did any of the main political parties raise that as an issue when they were supporting you, that, that, that there was more research needed? No. Certainly not in any forum that I was involved in, no. Right, right. Well, could it be that, uh, leading on from the Chair's point, that Northern Ireland is such a radically different part uh, of Ireland compared to the rest of it, in terms of the behaviour of those who purchase sex and pimps and, and those in the sex trade, that you'd require that research before you could implement something which is obviously acceptable in the Republic but may not be seen so in the North? Everybody's just looking at me. That's the same question that you it's asked a, at the beginning, it's really, it's isn't it? Difference. Related to, uh, is there a difference? Um, I suppose the sad thing is the research is almost universally consistent in relation to buying. It is indiscriminate. It is, I mean, for example, I did the research on the times. It is lunchtime and after work, primarily in the financial sectors in the South. They're the figures. It is mostly, as Sarah said, middle class professional. We have 10 studies of demands and buyers in Europe, and I could cite all of them. They are very consistent right across all of the 10 studies. There's global studies, there's, and I've, I've read them all. They are absolutely consistent. I doubt they're going to be that different in the North, um, but they are saying professional middle class. Um, the more the industry grows, as I said, the more normative it is, the more younger men will buy. Um, they're indiscriminate in relation to trafficked, coerced, pimped or independent. There is a huge level of dangerous, unprotected sexual activity that is very dangerous for young women's health. Um, and I suppose the other thing, if you and I studied a thousand of the posts on the internet of reviewers, um, they would be universal. In other words, sexual gratification very little concern, very dehumanising and objectifying in relation to young women. Um, and they would be, I, I know that ICI have drawn together some of this research, which shows all the common factors across the countries. And 
I don't believe that the North would be that different, no. Can I ask a question that troubles me and has been raised? Um, and I'm sure I'm playing devil advocate to some extent, but some of these women are from terribly poor parts of the world, Moldova or Nigeria or Cambodia or Vietnam. And the choice for them isn't between a perfect life and a poor life. The choice is between a pretty wretched life and an absolutely awful life. So for these women, uh, prostitution in Ireland, North and South, is a way out of abject poverty. Uh, we're not saying that the next step up is anything but pretty awful as well, but it is better in the sense that they have more money yeah. uh, and they've got yeah. accommodation and whatever. Yeah. Is there an argument that at, that at least that form of prostitution offers a way out of, of a completely wretched life back at home? OK. Um, I, for, first of all, mm. I don't, and obviously we don't, none of us here believe that prostitution is a solution to women's poverty. Uh, nor is it a solution to migrant women nor Irish women's poverty. But I would refer you, there's one only to very few studies on longitudinal studies, um, but there's one very major study which clearly demonstrates, it's also my experience, I've interviewed over 30 women. They are impoverished after prostitution. Prostitution does not solve impoverishment. Secondly, on top of that, they've lost probably the 10 years. Uh, this Linda, the Revere study is over a period of five years subsequent to women leaving prostitution. It's a very interesting study because it tracks all of the years that normally young women would be in school, in education, and achieving skills and training for the market, for the edu education and training and work market. They lose all those years in prostitution. They come out of prostitution, and remember, it's a young women's market. There is very few. There are very few women who remain in prostitution um, over, you know, 35 or 40. So they've lost those years. Second, the third issue is mental health issues. The fourth issue is sexual and physical violence, and the fifth issue is complex trauma. So there are five key indicators that she looked at, and in all of that, she clearly indicates not only is it not a route out of poverty, it's a route into more impoverishment. And I think really, you know, when you, like Ruham have said, are meeting women who have been in prostitution for 10, 15 years, this notion that it's a lucrative job that, is an, that in one way provides an exit from poverty is a dangerous myth. Furthermore, I have identified women from Benin and from Moldova and places that are highly impoverished. Of course we need to address women's poverty, the feminisation of poverty and gender inequality in those countries. But this, you know, what, what has happened, say, in Holland or has happened in other countries or in Germany, for example, along the borders of Germany with Czechoslovakia and non-accession countries, it is a critical issue that needs to be addressed. The industry is drawing impoverished women in. Like I spoke to the Lithuanian minister in the interior and as he said, you don't need to coerce our young women into the sex industries of the Western countries. It is the glamorous image that's created that it will give them a route out of poverty. So yeah, I think it's a very good question and I think it needs to be clearly, maybe again the evidence needs to be clear on the outcomes, the long-term outcomes for women. Clause 6 will reduce, uh, this is the intention, will reduce the amount of trade for those type of women, but there's also an argument that will reduce the trade for those who have make, made a, a an independent free will decision to become prostitutes, particularly at the upper end of the market. They, they would argue they enjoy their, their, their lifestyle, that they, they, they do become wealthy. There, there are stories of women charging £1,000 a night around the top class hotels in London. And on the web, they would indicate they're perfectly happy. So why should you use the clause six hammer to crack a nut when there's a lot of women who are not trafficked and who are, who are not looking out of the industry. Why should their career, if you call it that, be taken away from them at, in order just simply to tackle the lower end of the market? OK, well, the first thing I would ser seriously dispute from my interviews and research is a high end and a low end. Um, and I'll give you one example um, of a young woman from Brazil that we interviewed during the research, and she was in the top end of the market. Now, actually, what happened to her is very, very typical, is that at that end of the market, as opposed to buying her for an hour, they paid €400 Euro to have her for a night, and there was no boundaries whatsoever. <coughs> She'd been six weeks in the South, six weeks. She'd been a university student in Brazil. She was offered a year 
to work as an entertainer in Ireland and that it would fund her whole university college. We met her six weeks. She hadn't been in the one apartment longer than three days. She was seriously distraught and distressed and she had no memory of the number of men that had bought her. Now that's the top end of the market we're talking about. So let's be clear, first of all, that there are different types of markets. So for example, I went to some of the apartments in the financial sector and they might be considered some of the top end of the market because the money is higher. But it's very clear with some of the women I interviewed, they said they would rather be on the street because you were bought for one thing and it was over. So in these cases, you're in an apartment, you're naked, they walk in, they decide, they have you for that length of time. So as one woman said to me, you know, the level of power in that situation and isolation was greater for her at this top end of the market than the lower end. So I think these assumptions in the research, for example, are not borne out, for example, anymore that street prostitution is more violent than indoor prostitution. In some studies, sexual violence increases within indoor settings and the number of unwanted sexual acts increases. So I just, around the, around the language, we have to be careful. Are there women who claim and say, this is fine? Yes, of course there are. It is not, in my view, the role of the state to protect men's right to buy those particular group of women. They are a tiny minority. The second thing about them is it's a snapshot in time. You know, two of the women I interviewed said at one stage that's what they would have said if anyone had asked them. And now, five years on, serious drug addiction problems um, you know, were, were absolutely violated, gang raped in one of the apartment blocks. And suddenly all that gloss and that glamour that appears within the sex industry disappears very rapidly. So yes, I've interviewed women who at a different time in their life may have fitted that profile, actually. Um, but from their perspective, and I think survivors, as Sarah said, have a very particular level of knowledge. I mean, the women, even the seven women I interviewed last year, between them they were 50 years in the sex industry in the South. It gives you some idea of the level of knowledge and, you know, incredible contribution those women have to make to our knowledge. So I would be hugely respectful of any woman's choice and I would argue very strongly about choice. But I, I think constrained and circumscribed choice is what we should be looking at, really. Yeah. Just to get a, a little bit more clarity in my mind, in terms of the, the campaign in the South and the recommendations of the criminalisation for the purchase of sexual services, if um, the proposal here was to be brought forward in the Doyle, would you expect the parties to support it? If the same bill was to come forward in the Doyle, well, I mean, if you, uh, if you like, that's happened in a microcosm at the Oireachtas Justice Committee, where all parties are represented and people of no parties. And I mean, the decision there is unanimous. So, I mean, we would work on that assumption. We also have had 22 debates at local council level, um, including most of the major cities, uh, certainly Waterford, Cork, Galway, Limerick, where votes have been passed for the support of the major parties. The argument that I have heard here as to one of the reasons to oppose this is we're conflating prostitution and human trafficking and let's have two separate bills. Now I don't know if we would get, I don't know even then if we would actually still get the support, but the argument is being made, let's have two separate bills, we shouldn't be confusing them because this is confusing two separate issues. Is that an argument that you believe would be sustained in the Doyle amongst the political parties that this bill is confusing two issues and therefore... That, that's not the recommendation of the Justice Committee. We can only speak to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just would add, uh, it's very clear that um, the Joint Thrust Justice Committee, they went to Sweden for three days. And one of the, the reasons, I think, was to give <coughs> themselves, you know, a, to, to really answer all those questions. But there's no doubt within the report they have accepted unequivocally that it is not effective to separate 
trafficking and, and prostitution. prostitution. So fundamentally, I think you're right. That is a core issue that had to be addressed by the committee. Um, and you know, as Jerry said, that we, uh, you know, there was endless consultations with the committee, and they looked at all the evidence. And basically, that's the decision, which is that you are, cannot effectively address trafficking without addressing prostitution. Well, we're, we're meeting with the joint yeah. Oireachtas committee in the next couple of weeks, so we'll yes. obviously be able to continue that conversation with them. Um, Ms. McCorley. Um, and thanks for the presentation. The, um, much has been made about the um, decision of the Oireachtas Committee, but that was after 800 submissions. It was a very extensive piece of work. Um, but th they did go to Sweden, but they didn't speak to anybody who, who works in the, in the sex business or, or anybody who wasn't part of the, the government side of things. So I think that was a flaw in their their research. Uh, we recently went to Sweden when we did speak to uh, say both sides of the argument and it was invaluable because it did present you with a much fuller picture. Uh, I'm not opposed to legislation. I, I'm opposed to bad legislation. And we are in this role here in the North uh, to make legislation, and we have to make the best legislation, most informed, that we can do. And I don't think uh, part of that means just lifting pieces of work, pieces of evidence from other places, because where would that end? And how would you ever arrive at, at a solution or at a decision uh, or an agreement? Because you would always find somewhere else to lift evidence from, and we know about research and all of that. So. I believe that we do need to satisfy ourselves in the North that what we are going to enact here is something which applies in the North. So that's my reason for saying we do need a very evidence, a very clear evidence-based uh, position before we would move on uh, making legislation. Uh, but in terms of Clause 6, can I ask you what, what um, impact that will have on those people who are independent of gangsters and criminal gangs and human traffickers, the people who, who work independently and don't have uh, any desire or they feel they want to stay in, in the sex industry. How, how would that impact on them? You can. Um, okay, first of all, I suppose I just would like to say that the Department of Justice did have a conference specifically where sex workers from Thea Jacobson was in Dublin. So there wasn't, it wasn't that they didn't consult with people in Sweden who had a different position. Um, and, you know, just to clarify that, it wasn't that they ignored those positions, they actually <coughs> heard those positions. David Stanton was at that conference, who's the chair of the committee. So just to correct that, in relation to um, Clause 6, I think, first of all, I suppose it is a fundamental flaw to think that the prostitution sector can, you can separate out coercion, children, pimping, trafficking, and that within this somewhere you will find uh, this group of women who are independent. What I've said maybe wasn't very clear about the women that I think might have fitted that profile at a certain time in their lives. Some of those women, all of those women, in fact, were in it from the time they were teenagers. So, first of all, the entry route. The entry route isn't that somebody wakes up one morning and instead of going into college or into, you know, their lovely job, that they're suddenly waking up on their 18th birthday as an independent sex worker. That is a rare occasion, and I think most people would accept that. So, the course of circumstances in which entry into prostitution occurs is actually very similar, regardless of the point at which you are actually looking at women in the industry. So the supply and the course of circumstances apply right across the board. Um, and really, they are a combination of poverty, economic, socio-economic issues, and also personal factors of particularly child sexual abuse in childhood. That is, they are core issues that go right across all of the research in terms of entry. Once women are in there, as Sarah said, of course some women will try and remain independent and can do sometimes for a period of time. But having interviewed survivors who fitted that profile, as I said, at a certain time, it was a very brief time in their time in prostitution. Very brief time before something happened to them. It is a very dangerous 
you know, I, I was just talking about women in general, you know, create safety in relation to unknown locations. So I'll give you an example of one of the women who fitted that profile. She decided to do a party in one of the new apartment blocks in Dublin. And at that time, she, in that time, in that two hours, as she said, her life was changed by what happened to her at that party. Another woman who went off to Connemara in the west of Ireland and is sitting in a house in Connemara in the west of Ireland and two men arrive. So within, one has to remember when one is talking about this tiny group of independent women, we're also talking about women still operating within that environment that creates huge risk. So I would really urge people to look at the risk environment and not just to look at a tiny group of women. So what does Clause 6 do? I mean, Clause 6 is very clearly addressing demand. That's what you're talking about. You're trying to address demand to reduce the number of women drawn into the industry. And it is a preventative measure, um, it is a deterrent, and it's a declarative measure. That's what it is. Um, in relation to women, I could not agree more about the need for services. And one thing that's kind of presented a little bit in opposition is, you know, we, you know, the, the, the opposition between exit routes and, for example, a, a sexual health clinics. Um, we haven't found that in the South. There's actually great cooperation between the sexual health clinic, where women are in prostitution, remaining in prostitution, and with exit routes that Rohama provide. And similarly in Sweden, it isn't that they have stopped working with women who are still in prostitution and continue to be and say they are choosing to be. But that, there will come a time, very quickly, where those women want to exit. So it isn't an either or, I would say to you. Very clearly, I would totally support harm reduction, health clinics and sexual health clinics, running very clearly parallel with opportunities to exit. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you um, for your presentation. In, in what was a very difficult subject area, the, the, the Swedish National Rapporteur in 2010 said, according to the Swedish police, it's clear that the ban on the Purchase of Sexual Services Act as a barrier to human traffickers and procurers. It, sorry. That, that the ban on the Purchase of Sexual Services Act as a barrier to human traffickers and procurers who are considered establishing themselves in Sweden. That's clearly seen as a barrier. And yet, a month later, the National Police Board in Sweden said, serious organised crime, including prostitution and trafficking, has increased in strength, power and complexity during the past decade. It constitutes a serious social problem in Sweden, and organised crime makes large amounts of money from the exploitation and trafficking of people under slave-like conditions. Two completely different perspectives from the same people. I, I wouldn't see that they're two completely different perspectives, I have to say. Um, I, I really do, I mean, I think the Swedish approach is put up there as if it's perfect, as Sarah said. Um, of course there's prostitution in Sweden. There's also trafficking in Sweden. I think where Sweden comes out of this we're differently... Not, is that we're not in danger of confusing the two? No. I think very clearly you need the comparative figures. The comparative figures are tiny in comparison to, first of all, the very big sex industry countries like the Netherlands yes. and Germany. Yes. But yes. even if you compare them to their Nordic neighbours, yes. what the Swedes are saying is it's a reduction issue. It, it, of course the police there are still fighting organised crime. But how they do we know it's produced? They haven't produced any figures since 2007. Well, actually, uh, these I have a whole list of figures here by um, these... The International Labour Organisation research. Oh, the, 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 the Swedish National Rapporteur, the Swedish Poli National Police Board have not produced any figures since 2007. On what? On prostitution. There are no published figures. Well, they ceased giving statistics in 2007. Uh, well, I've just read the two, the two uh, police reports of 2010 and 2011, and I think there's a bit of confusion about the, the reports. The figures they are 0, 0 and 2010 question mark. I'll send you the two reports, if you like. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Carla Valsberg, you know, yeah. the National Rapporteur, yeah. what she's saying is you look at the, st you look at the, the figures in relation yeah. to buying, procuring, yeah. pimping, aggravated pimping, yeah. 
um, and trafficking, coercion, rape, all of the figures. So they, I, I'm not sure why somebody would say they're on figures because I've just looked at them. Now, they are comparatively small, as I yes. said. Yes, they I are comparatively small yeah. compared to other countries, say, like the Netherlands, where it's yeah. 900 or 1,000 victims of trafficking. Yes. You're talking maybe four cases. Four. But it peaked they, at 11 in 2006 and dropped to 2 in 2007. Yeah. You see, they are tiny in relation to trafficking, but if you do look at pimping, aggravated pimping, coercion and p procuring, for example, and then you look at, they've published all the figures on buying and the purchase of yeah. sex, you do get a much broader picture of the industry itself and the prosecution mechanisms. So, yeah, I... I absolutely, I, yeah. you know what I mean? It is it, it, very it, tiny it in is. relation to the countries. It, it, in relation to um, those people who are trafficked in migrant workers coming in, um, part of the, the whole process in Sweden has been to tell us that this has been a, a very strongly feminist agenda. It has been to protect women um, who, who, who have been violated as a result of this. Why then has Sweden, under its Aliens Act, not decriminalised prostitution for everyone? Um, who, every woman who comes into Sweden. Only Swedish nationals uh, are entitled to, to, to protection under the Swedish model, and therefore all migrants and people coming in, it is illegal to provide sexual services. You're, you're, it is unlawful for any alien to provide sexual services in Sweden. So it's not as universal as people may think it is or as it's presented as, and in fact it is arguably anti-immigrant in the sense that um, immigrants coming in effectively are deported. So they're getting rid of the problem. They're not actually resolving the problem with the very human being who has the problem. Well, now you're bringing up the whole issue of immigration, and obviously it intersects. The issue of immigration and legal status is a huge issue. But so, if you want to decriminalise it, surely yeah. you should decriminalise yeah, it for no, everyone. I'm coming to that. I mean, in Holland, it is exactly the same. Remember, it is a relation to legal status and entry into the country. Yeah. I think we, don't, we have to be careful not to collapse two issues. In the South, I mean, the Immigrant Council have been a prime advocate of migrant rights and I think that's critical and I would agree with you and I would agree with you in relation to Sweden and every other European country. Yeah. We need to look at migrant rights but I am very clear that the Immigrant Council have been absolutely clear we do not want legal uh, uh, permits for migrant women to enter the sex industry, which is what D Holland, the Netherlands are advocating, remember, is that they're advocating yeah. that we will give migrant women yeah. Legal status, no. permission to enter but the state. Just, I'll just finish. No. And the reality of that is they're not giving migrant women permission to enter the state for any other areas. No. And, you know, I think the Immigrant Council have been very clear that you're right, we absolutely need to monitor the effectiveness and in relation to deportations. But, but any, any bill has to yeah. tackle that issue yes. because otherwise it, it has no benefit mm. for the immigrant. Um, because they are treated completely differently from the indigenous um, sex worker or prostitute uh, in those circumstances. And it, 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 that, that's, if, if the bill were to progress, that is, a, that is an inherent failure. And in fact, it's perhaps a very radical argument, to su not to suggest that, uh, because you, you get into the situation mm -hmm. that you've described, mm -hmm. where you're effectively giving a licence to people to come into the country. But we've got to have some mechanism, if we're going to say to the provider of the service that you are not going to be criminalised as a result yes. of this, then you're going to have to tackle that issue equally and fairly for the immigrant as everyone else. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, part of, a huge part of the recommendations that we made in the research was that all migrant women who have been sexually exploited within the destination country, that their undocumented status be regularised yeah. and that they be afforded protection just the same as traffic victims. Yeah. And we have a very limited number of women being given recovery and reflection yeah. periods, I have to say, yeah. even where there are cases of trafficking. Yes. And I would be completely in agreement yeah. with you around, well, you know, for Fortress Europe in relation to those migrant women's yeah. rights. I don't think it's, I think it's very important to separate the issue of women entering the country to be in prostitution yes. and being careful about that and the protection of migrant rights and their undocumented status. I couldn't agree more and I believe that when the raids happen, for example, in a brothel, mm -hmm. we should be looking at those women as sexually exploited in Ireland yes. and that we should be looking at their undocumented status, yes. which for the most part they are. Yes. I have to say 87% of the women we looked at were migrant women. Uh, and it's effectively how yeah. we treat the modern slave. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And the yes. best way to treat the voluntary slave is not necessarily to deport them. Absolutely. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr McCartney. Uh, thank you very much, and again, thank you very much for your presentation. I, I mean, I was struck by what John said that when you started this pro uh, process, you had more questions than you had perhaps answers, and I think that's the way all of us come out because, uh, I mean, our party colleagues are very, very comfortable with the fact that we are interrogating this piece of legislation, so it's the best piece of legislation comes out the other side, much in the same way they had 800 witnesses in front of their actors' committee before they formed their view, and I think that's the way. We all should approach it rather than just having a blind approach. You think it's right, and then forget about what our people say about it. So it's with that in mind that I asked a couple of questions. Was the Arachnus report uh, a single issue agenda, or did they recommend that there should be services uh, uh, that would back up and support the need to tackle this issue? Absolutely, yeah. 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 I mean, they they fully support what you were saying earlier. Obviously, that you know the Swedish law, as I said, was declarative, normative, and came along with a package of services. Now, it's not in the law as such, but certainly the Joint Threats Committee includes that. Yeah. yeah. And the current yeah. bill, as presented to us, do you feel that provides enough service and backup to make this? Uh, it will have the intended consequence? Yeah, I mean, I think that that is an infrastructure you should demand. I mean, I, I think services demand uh, that resourcing, and you know, any legislation should come with that. I don't necessarily think it will be in the bill, yeah. no more than it is in the bill presented. In fact, the, the, uh, the actual wording of an act on the purchase of sex is very tiny, it's very small, it's a very simple piece of legislation. And it's, <coughs> when you look at the Swedish law, the package in relation to services does come. Yeah. It, you know, with that, but in terms of the wording, it's not going to be in your act. I would think. Actually. You know, but there can be a tendency, perhaps, yeah. you know, a proper or whatever, but that nearly because you, you outlaw or ban the purchase of sex, then that's the answer to all your problems. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think we have to make sure that's. Not the, and I think that's Absolutely. why this is sometimes, unfortunately, reduced. You know, that in other words, that we can all sit back in our comfortable chairs and say if we bring us in then that's the end of prostitution and traffic in all over the world. You know, and I guess sometimes it's how it's presented because it's very interesting that in Sweden, and this is from the, the report which you yourselves have supplied the committee, you know, that most of the people who are arrested and convicted don't see a court. That, that it's done behind closed doors. It's a, a, a fine and, and the police themselves have actually said that they could arrest more because the deterrent isn't enough, and th that makes me wonder. Because you know, does it then? You have this sort of thing. You feel, you know, if you do that, that's enough. But if there's not other things run alongside it, then you're deluding yourself that you're going to have the intended consequence. I I would agree with all of that in relation to the importance that a law is only one mechanism. I mean, I know Sarah mentioned the drink driving law, but I would mm. say about law as a deterrent. You know, we had education campaigns, we had so much resources in the South in relation to drink driving, and not one thing changed. And the first thing that changed was the introduction of a law in relation to points. So I think, to go back to the Swedish law, yeah, it was a declarative and normative law originally. Now, in relation to the arrests, yeah, it's very rare that anybody... There hasn't been prison sentences, for example. It's summary fines, and most people admit to it. And from a Swedish perspective, that is a success. They're not in, they are a rehabilitative kind of justice system. They're not into trying to put people in prison for this. So from their perspective, it is a deterrent in relation to that that person gets a summary fine. That's it. Um, in relation to should legislation be introduced with a package, absolutely. Should it be reviewed and researched absolutely. in relation to its implementation, completely agree with you. I think all those things are for <coughs> to ensure and will... You know, I, I do think, having spent a good bit of time with the police in Sweden, it does give a clear mandate to the police that these women are not criminals. These women are victims of sexual exploitation and deserve respectful treatment from that. I do think it changes the mind of police in relation to their role in relation to women in prostitution. I, I, I certainly felt that working with them and with the services there, that their mindset in relation to their role as police officers, is to protect the person in prostitution, to prosecute everything surrounding that, 
that creates that exploitation. And I wasn't being naive. I asked a million questions, you know, hard questions oh, no, of them, I, obviously, because I come from a background of yeah. working in a refuge and services. So I would agree with you completely about that. But, but one of the things that sort of, I mean, it was said here today, is that uh, Garda Sikona haven't supported, that they weren't part of the, the support for this? The, the Gardaí um, aren't allowed to give a view on, on, on policy. They did testify before the Oireachtas Committee. It's not for me to speak for them, but I mean, yeah. in summary, sure. they said they were, they were talking about the levels of prostitution. They spoke about 800 women in the South every day. They spoke about <clears throat> quite clearly that um, prostitution in the South is run by organised crime and by gangs, domestic and foreign. Mm. But uh, they, they did not give a view, uh, and indeed they are restricted from giving a view on, on policy. Because, again, one of the things that, I mean, again, from the, the, the Swedish government report was that in Sweden the, there was a tendency to allow the law to be broke before they intervened. Mm. You know, and I think when Monica was speaking, you were saying about the number of underage girls that are involved, yet. We don't see convictions for, yeah. you know, maybe people not paying for sexual services, yeah. but certainly people have been guilty of a, 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 an offence. But you know, and that, 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 you know, that's that's why I'm saying, that, you know, the, the the department has told us that there's enough laws in and around this, you know, to to tackle it. You know, people make the, the the contention from their point of view quite rightly. You know, an hour law would give you an hour uh, something on the menu to to ensure you have the intended result. But if there isn't an intent from the people who should be, be, be doing this, then you could uh, be putting on a piece of legislation and then we all sit back and be content. But there's no, you know, because even, I, I mean, I'm not sure with the figure, when you say there were 600 prostitutes, was that of Swedish nationals or in total in Sweden? No, in total. That's in, in total, in total, yeah. okay. And I think just one comment on that again, again, as part of our own learning, was, and I often get, I think we get distracted about the Swedish model or the Dutch model. At this stage now, I've certainly, I think we've gone through a process where, look, maybe we should stop trying to replicate what's been done, OK? If you get to a fundamental point of belief that we want to change the system and we know why, between us, we know what the implications are. And if it's talked through and thrashed out, we understand what's required from the point of view of services, from the point of view of law, from the point of view of rehabilitation. And, you know, the Swedish model, in one respect, has been a great advantage and a great burden to this whole debate because, as we've seen today, there's as much information coming from all sides, some validated, some not. So what I just would, would, would suggest is that at the end of the process you're going through now as you learn and gather the information and understand is to kind of draw a breath and step back a bit and say, look, you know, we know what we want to do and we understand how the system works within your own uh, government. What do we need to do to ensure that a holistic, complete approach is in place? Mm -hmm. And don't get distracted with what's gone wrong elsewhere. I mean, all I know is that I've got to a point now where, in my education in this process, I don't want to live in a country where it is regarded as OK to buy a woman or a girl. Okay? And in that process, I have formed a view with regard to, at a very basic level, what I think and what I believe in. And through my education, again, with the work that Monica, Monica has done, I mean, when we started this process, remember, we got involved as an organisation in the Immigrant Council because of trafficking. And nobody around the table is going to say trafficking is good or right. Okay, so everybody was all in agreement on that. And when the debate opened into prostitution, it went so many different directions. And I certainly had no experience or exposure to prostitution previously. And I would have had very, kind of, I suppose, antiquated views and I kind of, the old consenting adults and everything else. And as I've now educated and understood the process, I'm very, very clear in my mind as to why we as an organisation are both involved and committed to this, and why we've gone to the bother of creating a coalition of 68 organisations, and why, why we've tormented ourselves dealing with every political party in the country and educating. I mean, I can tell you, it has been an uphill battle, and I suppose what is a great achievement for the, the campaign and all of the members is that we have such unanimous support, OK? And I'm not suggesting that it was easy or you would necessarily get there yourself. But the point is that we've got to just, just strip back, back to the facts, back to the basics, and ask ourselves those fundamental questions and don't get distracted. And I think that, you know, even the information that Monica shared today, you know, the power of that being put into a four-page document, OK, highlighting the key outputs of the key research, I think would be very helpful for everybody. Because we've all gone through this process, and even if there's a particular issue, 
you go on the internet, you start going through, you look at the United Nations, you, and at the end of the evening, you're demented. You don't know what's right, what's wrong, what's distracted, what's, the, what, what's real. So was this is the purpose of the, the discussion and debate, and I, and I think it would be very interesting, well, I suspect it would be very interesting when you meet the joint Baroctus Committee uh, from the South, because, I mean, they've had the, because of the 800 submissions, written submissions, verbal submissions, and, uh, you know, I think there'll be great learning from that. But again, not to get distracted and not to get too caught up in even the minutiae, okay? What fundamentally we want to do, and I have one, just one other comment again, I think, which is very interesting for us. And you think about the work that's been done north and south with regard to our economy, the culture, developing and presenting ourselves as, as, as for foreign direct investment. What struck me in one of the early stages of the discussion in Europe was that Ireland, the south, was being seen as becoming potentially the red light centre of Europe. Okay. Now, just as a, as a comment that was passed on, right, and you kind of think, well, no, if that's because of our legislation made it easy for traffickers to get people in, that Ireland was being used as a place for trafficking women in to the north, to the rest of Europe and everything else, that was certainly from a a political and economic point of view, a brand that you did not want to have yourself associated with. And what I think is much more important, which would be fantastic in one respect, is that if North and South we could find a, a form of words or a, 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 a presentation of some sense of an all-island view of this, okay, it's sending out an extraordinarily powerful message to the rest of the world. Uh, I was recently at a, at a, at a, a foreign direct investment conference with the IDA and Enterprise Ireland in Dublin. And it is extraordinary how important these social issues are for those international organisations that look into a country. And we actually have the ability and the capacity, both here in the north and in the south, to make a very clear, strong, progressive statement that might make us be at the cutting edge in a European, possibly global context with regard to this issue and not get distracted. So for me, it's an opportunity that we can't miss. And I think back to your point again, we don't want to get it wrong. And, you know, we mightn't get it 100% right, but even, I think, that, I mean, the, the fact that we're having this discussion, when we started this debate back in 2009, I had people approach me and say, John, don't go there. Just don't go there. This is an issue that we don't want discussed. You know, leave it, to, leave it, leave it as it is, OK? And we had to fight very hard to get that debate going. And we've now got to a point where we've made, I suppose, extraordinary progress in one, in, in one context. But it's an opportunity we can't miss. So. I'm sorry, if I could just say sorry. on behalf, I suppose, of the trade unions that are involved in the South and indeed in the North, because our position has been endorsed at the Irish Congress of Trade Unions at the Biennial Conference, which is held here in the North, and as well by the National Women's Council, that is both the North and South um, initiative. And on behalf of the INMO, I mean, you know, again, it's easy to look at the sex trade and women in the sex trade as workers. Now, as a trade unionist, the day that someone tells me that sex workers will be unionised and be giving le legislative entitlements as workers, then perhaps I might change my opinion. But I certainly don't ever see that as being a prospect for the majority of women. We can all focus on the very minority who might be they're from choice, but I would say that the majority of these women cannot be classed as workers, either immigrant or Irish. They cannot be classed as workers. They are not given rights and entitlements. They are not given rights to any sort of when annual leave, sick pay, sick leave. You know, so we can't class them as workers. And I think every trade unionist would agree with that. And I know that was something very strongly spoken of at both the conferences north and south and within the National Women's Council. And those movements are, as you know, it's an Ireland um, group that we're talking about. And I think from the healthcare point of view and the social point of view, we have to be very cognitive of the impact on healthcare for these women that crea is created in our societies and for the knock-on. And to say, I mean, some people will try and say that it's about their rights and it's about trying to improve their health and safety. That isn't true. It is not about their rights or their health and safety. It is purely a means of money being made, and most of that money is controlled by the pimps and the men who control the industry. Yeah. Hey, Mr Elliott. Uh, Chair, thanks, thanks very much for that. I have just one question that's, that's slightly different. I noticed in your presentation that you talked about the limited time frame 
the requirement for proof of coercion. What did you see, like to see that extended to? Obviously, you were indicating that the time frame wasn't sufficient. I'm not sure I understand the question. The limited time frame in relation to... You, you say here, um, yeah. while the Policing and Crime Act of 2009 was welcome advanced Northern Ireland's anti-trafficking legislation, its impact has been limited by the requirement of proof of coercion within the very limited time frame. So obviously you were saying that that wasn't sufficient? It's within That's six months, me, I think, rather than mm -hmm. the written... Three. Turn off the red light. Can't oh, okay. Yes. Page, Sorry, I just thought you meant today that I was speaking no, about. No. Okay. Um, proof of coercion within a very limited time frame. Well, uh, you know, I actually think this is exactly the same as in the south. What we have in the south is, you know, a huge, big infrastructure in relation to trafficking and in relation to crimes that are related to trafficking. So I'm not sure that I am an expert in relation to this. So, you know, it's a completely different debate, I think, in relation to that. And I'm, I'm actually not, I'm not fully, you know, I'm not a solicitor and I'm not actually fully aware of the implications in relation to that. So if you, I'd prefer not to answer it, actually. We, 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 we'll come back to you on that. But I'll come back yeah. to you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it it's just nobody from the yeah, sorry, yeah, there's actually, nobody yeah, from the, the, the person from that side just isn't with us exactly. today. But we, we, if with, the, yeah. with the chair's permission, we're happy to follow up, yeah. either by email or by making them available. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Wales, uh, just one final question: Are you aware of a, an alternative campaign called "Turn Off the Blue Light" campaign? Uh, if you are aware of it, have you any idea who, who's actually behind that? We're aware of the existence of the website. Um, Apart from that, not, not an awful lot else. You have no evidence, for instance, that that campaign is, is linked to or controlled by those who are involved in the sex trade? Yeah. The very simple answer is yes, but not to libel oneself. Uh, I think there is very clear links with the sex trade, very clear links with a very well-known pimp and organiser. Um, so yes, it's the simple answer. Um, are there genuine concerns from other organisations? Yes, but does the Turn Off the Blue Light campaign represent? No. We have privilege within this committee, and I believe that Mr. Peter McCormick is the person in charge of Turn Off the Blue Light campaign. Yes. Yes. Are you in a position to confirm that? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, um, can I thank you very much for coming to the committee? I was struck, John, by your comments mm -hmm. about an all-Ireland message, and I just say, as, as a unionist, I would love to have an all-Ireland message on this. Now, I only have the advantage of six counties to consult with colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> Others have 32 counties. Um, one would hope they could be better informed on this issue, but certainly I would like there to be a united approach in how we deal with this, because whatever jurisdiction decides to go first on this will have implications for the other that doesn't. Um, uh, and I don't want us to be left behind here um, in Northern Ireland. So can I thank you very much for coming to the committee? It's been thank you. And just one last thing to say, I think that I mean, it's great to have the dialogue and have the engagement. And I think that it's very difficult often to get the balance of information right. And I think that whatever can be done going forward with a continued engagement, I think it could be very, very helpful. And we're certainly very happy to share with you our knowledge, our research, our insight, limited in all as it might be, to help with the Garth process you're going through, because I said we have been here, and it is both difficult and challenging. And I think that, you know, we may have something to bring to the party. So we're very happy to participate. And thank you. Thank you Thanks very much. Thank, thank you. you. Very good. Very nice. Okay, members, we'll move on to the next um, evidence session, and we have a representative from the International Union of Sex Workers um, to give us evidence. Page 65 of your meeting folder um, will be helpful to members. Uh, so I welcome Laura Lee um, from the International Union of Sex Workers to the meeting. Again, as before, we appreciate you taking the time to, to come here to help us as we deliberate on these important issues. Uh, as with the other sessions, it will be recorded by Hansard and then it will be published in due course. So I'm going to hand over to you at this stage and then members, I'm sure, will have some questions. Sure. Um, Mr Chairperson, Committee, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, let me begin by saying that, um, obviously, I'm Irish. I'm from Dublin originally. I've been working in the sex industry now for 20 years. 
um, in various capacities. I've worked all over the country um, in the south and indeed up here in the north as well. So I'm speaking from a, bit, a bit base of vast experience. Um, in all of my time um, working as a sex worker, I have never come across a woman <coughs> I would have deemed to be coerced or trafficked in any way. Um, I have certainly come across some women that have been working in desperate circumstances, there's no doubt about that. <coughs> but if we're looking at the strict le uh, legal definition of trafficking, then no. Turning to the legal definition of trafficking, um, as things stand at the moment, if I'm in Belfast for two to three days and it's particularly busy or buoyant, and I place a call back home to Scotland and say to one of my pals, hey, come on out to Belfast, it's quite busy, I'll just buy the um, airfare for you online. I'm therefore deemed to have trafficked her into the country. The fact that I don't make any money from anything that she does is immaterial, so I think we need to look very closely at the statistics when they're being, um, when they're being mooted. As far as I'm concerned, um, the Swedish model has been very problematic in terms of the single biggest problem that you have here in Ireland at the moment is in relation to stigma. It's huge around the sex industry. Um, it's still very big. Um, and I wanted to tell you about a lady in Sweden called Petit Yasmin. She was an activist like myself with the Rose Alliance. Um, she was, like myself, um, a mother as well, um, <coughs> and um, a very, very a beautiful person by all accounts. The Swedish authorities refused to believe that she could possibly enjoy her job in sex work. Um, because they accused her of having what they call false consciousness, <clears throat> so that she had some form of PTSD. They took her children from her. They awarded custody of her children to her abusive ex-partner, who went on to stab her to death. That's the realities of the Swedish model. And we, we all mourned for Yasmin last year when that happened. Speaking for myself, I can tell you that in my time I can remember the murder of Belinda Pereira in Dublin. She suffered a terrible death with a, with a claw hammer and she worked in the same apartment that I worked in. Now that should never, ever have happened because what we should be looking towards doing is doing what Canada have just done and that is decriminalising the sex industry so that now in Canada women can work together for safety and they can go to the police and they can freely admit that they're working together for safety. And they can... We talked briefly earlier on about some of the clients making reports on girls that they might deem as being frightened or coerced. They most certainly do. It really galls me to see uh, my clients painted as some sort of uh, uncontrollable animals, as they, as they usually are in the press. You know, Some of my clients have been with me for years and we've become dear friends apart from anything else. But yes, of course, they would go and report if they saw a woman who was suffering. Um, and indeed, I have done reports on their behalf um, and on a third party basis as well. <coughs> um, I also remember the body of Sinead Kelly that was found by the canal in Dublin as well, also should never have happened. Um, and I really do think that if the Swedish model is brought in in any way, shape or form in the north or in the south of Ireland, that the state will have blood on its hands. And that's a very strong statement to make, but it happens to be entirely true. I can say, in all honesty, that in over 20 years of sex work now, I've only ever felt in fear of my life once, and that was when I was caught up in a bank raid. Um, we know because the evidence is clear from, um, from the, pardon me, the United Nations, they've called for complete decriminalisation as well, because they are aware that the further away you push sex workers, the harder it is to reach the most vulnerable. And let's be clear, there are vulnerable people in, in sex work. And I'm not going to deny that for a minute, but there are vulnerable people in many other industries as well. We do need to separate out sex work and trafficking. We absolutely do need to draw a distinction between the two because trafficking happens for a variety of reasons. Trafficking happens for domestic servitude, for cockle picking, for all sorts of reasons as well, not just sex work. To be clear, I'm not pro-sex industry. I'm aware my job is not simple for many people for many different reasons, um, but I'm pro the individual's rights and I'm pro sex workers' rights and I do believe, and it was touched on earlier on, that we should be entitled to the same labour rights as everybody else and it's only in moving towards that that we will finally strip down the stigma attached to sex work. Um, oh, I've completely lost what I was going to say there for a minute. 
Um, yes, so in my, in my experience, and it is, it is vast experience, um, you know, for example, I know that turn off the red light um, last year were saying something like 19 children were trafficked in 2012 to the Republic of Ireland uh, for the, the sex industry. Now, on the face of it, that sounds absolutely appalling. And as a mother myself, I'd be, you know, apoplectic with rage. The truth, however, is that there was nothing to do with prostitution. Yes, they were trafficked in, but they were used for th other things entirely. It was nothing to do with the sex trade. So, um, it was actually Minister Alan Shatter himself who, who released that in 2013, in December, in his report. Minister Shatter, to my mind, is only too well aware of the differences between trafficking and sex work, and he can see the difference. And I don't honestly believe that this law will come in in, in, the, in the Republic of Ireland, in spite of what other people might say. Um, I believe that that's all I really wanted to say for now. I'm sure you'll have plenty of questions for me, which I'm very happy to answer. OK, well, thank you very much, Laura, for that. Just um, for me to establish the extent of who you claim to represent, it would be useful just to know, um, in terms of the International Union of Sex Workers, what is the, the membership of it? And how many... You, you've talked about your vast experience, but yes. how many people would you purport to be speaking for in terms of this union? Well, I have found myself in the, um, I don't know whether you'd call it fortunate or unfortunate position of becoming the, the voice really for sex workers in Ireland and that's because of stigma I experienced myself. So in that regard, I think you could say that I'm speaking for the vast majority of them because I know from speaking to sex workers, thank you, myself, that they don't want this law brought in and they're, they're afraid because they know the damage it will do. The other thing I wanted to mention was that in Sweden, uh, we talked about the police and the actions of the police in Sweden. In Sweden, I'm aware as well that what the police will actually do is they will target sex workers at their homes, sex workers that are working from home, because it's easy pickings in terms of getting convictions against the buyers. So they will literally sit outside a property and arrest each buyer as they're coming back out. What that results in is, is that sometimes the landlord will then establish that he actually has a sex worker living in his property, whereas before he might not have had a clue, because nine times out of ten were very, very discreet, you would never know. And ultimately the sex worker is then rendered homeless. Now, if that's how we purport to protect vulnerable women, then I'm pretty much lost for words. You know, somebody said that I don't want to be part of a country which says that it's OK to buy sex. I don't want to be part of a country which denies me my right to, to feed my family and pay my bills. That's what this comes down to. I'm not a particularly stupid woman. I'm currently working on my second degree. Um, really just a perpetual student, if I'm being honest. Um, so when they talk about prostitution as violence against women, I think I would recognise an act of violence being you know, done to me over such a long period of time. And I don't think I'm alone in that assertion either. Uh, just, and, and obviously if you're doing your second degree, you're an intelligent woman, but to go back to my question, um, you've said you speak for the vast majority. I'm mm. trying to quantify, can you give me a number um, of the, the number of sex workers that you're, you purport to speak for? Well, in the UK, statistics are quite, because it's such a clandestine industry in some regards, statistics are hard to come by, but the estimates are that there's 80,000 sex workers at the moment in the UK. And that's going across the broad spectrum, so that's including like webcam, strippers, etc. And they're all members of your international union? No, no, no they're not, no. So h how many people are actually members of this international union of sex workers? I'm not entirely sure on that. I would have to look that up and come back to you. No, it's, it's just because you've said you speak for the vast majority, and yes. I'm trying to establish um, the actual credibility of the organisation that you're purporting to represent. I think right. that's important because obviously mm. we'll refer back to this evidence session of course. and we need to know that what you've said is from a credible organisation. Mm -hmm. So how many members are there in the International Union of Sex Workers? I would need to just check that out and revert and come back to you. Okay. Uh, how many of them are from Northern Ireland? Oh gosh, good question. I, I don't honestly know, but I will find out for you. Okay. Okay, so you don't know those answers. In terms of... Um, uh, you touched on it in your opening remarks about a client. Do you arrange for women and clients in Northern Ireland to engage in sex? Is that part of your role? No, no. I'm, I'm solely independent, so I just run my own diary. OK, so you're not involved in, in setting up appointments um, for clients and other women in Northern Ireland? 
No, no. OK. But you do come here yourself? I do, yes, once a month. OK. OK, thank you. Um, Mr Wells? Is uh, Laura Lee your real name? No, it's not. It's my, it's my working name. So it's a, it's a bit difficult to put a, a great degree of... ..reliability, I've been drinking water, on, on uh, your evidence um, if you don't actually know your identity. You're welcome to my real name if you wish. Are you prepared to release that? Yes, I am. It's Antoinette Cosgrave. Right, OK, thank you for that. Um, are there any pimps or those who profit from um, organising sexual services in your international union of sex workers? So some of the members are managers, yes. So they're pimps? Well, if you want to use that term, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's not just a union of sex workers, it's also those who control sex workers? Yes. Right, and who make large amounts of money and control the lives of sex workers? Well, I can't comment on how much money anybody else makes, but... Right. Would one of those be a Mr Douglas Fox? Yes. Right. And you, are you aware of Mr Douglas Fox's operations in the north of England? I am, yes. Are you aware that he controls one of the largest um, escort websites in the United Kingdom? Uh, I wasn't aware of that. No. Well, he said in the Northern Echo that he indeed him and his civil partner were indeed controlling a website that sells the services of prostitutes. OK. I was aware that Douglas's partner is involved, certainly, in the management of an escort agency, but that's about as much as any, really. So, so uh, again, following up the questions of Mr um, Given, uh, trying to work out exactly where you're coming from, you're an organisation that represents the sex industry, including those, including uh, Mr Fox, who make vast amounts of money from selling females for sexual care services. Well, stepping aside from that, stepping aside from that, I'm speaking um, more so for myself as an Irish sex worker as well and from my own experiences. That's what's crucially important here. Yes, but, but if one of your main supporters and funders is someone who has acknowledged that he runs a website selling sexual services to thousands of, uh, thousands of women every year, then clearly that does indicate a slightly different angle on what the meaning of the International Union of Sex Workers means. I just don't see how that could undermine my own personal credibility. Well, why, how would it undermine, Mrs. Lee, or Ms. Mrs. Cosgrove, is that clearly if those who are supporting your union mm -hmm. and perhaps funding your union have an incredibly high vested interest in selling the services of women for sexual services, then you're not a union representing the ordinary woman on the street or in the flat. You're representing an organisation that is making vast amounts of money out of the sale of women. OK. I don't just work with the International Union of Sex Workers. I also work with Scott Pepp in Edinburgh as well. So I work with a lot of people. Um, and my aim is not to protect any financial interest at all. My aim is to save lives here. Yes. You made the extraordinary comment that you had never met any woman who had been trafficked or coerced yes. into the sale of sexual services. That's right. Now, I have to say, in all of the arguments that have been made by every organisation against Clause 6. That's the first time that anyone has said that. And yet the PSNI, in its most recent figures, said that even they, and they're not the most strongest and strongest supporters of this bill, mm. they have said that there were 50 or 60 victims of trafficking for sexual services in Northern Ireland. So I think I got it totally wrong. There's no one out there being coerced into sexual services. Oh, no, I'm not saying that for one moment. But obviously, as an independent operator, there are very few kind of other sex workers that I would come into contact with on a regular basis. I don't work in a brothel. So you're saying it's not that they're not out there, it's just that you haven't encountered them? Oh, I, I acknowledge that there is a problem, but I don't think it's as widespread as is being reported. So should you accept, do you accept that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of young women in the United Kingdom and the Irish Republic who have been brought in for, for the sale of sexual services? Some trafficked, some induced, and some of their own free will? Yes. What's the first so, thing? so there is there is trafficking, there is coercion. There is, yes. Now you, you, you quite rightly pointed out the tragedy of Petite Jasmine, uh, and, and that is a very sad case, and we're aware of it. And that happened in Sweden. And since 1998, that is the only example of a prostitute in Sweden having been killed. In Holland, in the same period, and of course, as you know, prostitution in Holland is entirely legalised and controlled. Yes. There have been 127 murders of prostitutes under their system in Holland and one in Sweden. So why would prostitutes be safer, given those statistics, if you make it totally legal? 
Well, given those statistics, I can see what you mean. But as things stand at the moment, we enjoy a very open relationship with the police, and I would have no qualms whatsoever going forward and telling the police about any concerns I had. Um, and it would, this law, were it, it to go through, would drive us further and further away from the police. That's my big concern. You, you, you say that, and uh, we, we have this view that if we introduce Clause 6, we'll have a situation where um, uh, clients would be less likely to report examples of, of abuse, trafficking, maybe women being held under, uh, under control without their consent. Does that actually happen? Are your members regularly contacting the police uh, and are your clients and saying, I was with a certain woman and she looked distressed, she looked like she'd been trafficked. Does that happen? Yes, it does absolutely happen. And I've seen it myself personally on several occasions. And the other thing you must bear in mind as well is that it's not just the clients, but it's we, the sex workers, that will report um, things that are untoward as well because we're quite self-regulatory in, in, some, in some respects. So, for instance, if I got wind of an underage girl working for a particular brothel, I'd report that straight away. Right. Um, you say that it would be driven underground. Uh, if Clause 6 was enacted. Um, how would a client make contact with a prostitute if it had been driven underground? How, how would that physically be possible? And if the client can make contact uh, with the prostitute, why would the police not be able to make the same contact? Because what you find now is that there are flats, and they'll be known to the police. The police will know who, like where they are and who's working where. That's their job. But if the law was to change, I think what would happen is that it would become more fluid and the women that do so badly need our help would be moved an awful lot more frequently to avoid detection. Um, and that's, that's you know, the sad downside of it, really. So, so you're, you're saying that, again, well, there's absolutely no evidence of it happening in Sweden. You believe that would happen in Ireland? Yes, I do. Right. Um, I've just, I'm just, uh, this, you're asking the questions a bit more quickly than I expected, so I'm actually, look, go ahead, just, just maybe I'll come back. Yes. The point I wanted to pick up on was you said that if we bring this law in, and it was a very strong statement, we will have blood on our hands. Yes. Now, given the figures that Mr Wells outlined about the Swedish model, I think it's actually uh, one death, tragic, within the last 25 years in Sweden, compared to Holland, which has legalised it. Um, how then would we have blood on our hands if we tried to, to bring in to being what the Swedish model has, has achieved? Because I firmly believe that you're targeting the wrong with the greatest of respect. That sounds um, that came out completely wrong. I think that what, what you're looking at doing is targeting the wrong group of people. You're looking at targeting the buyers of, for, for the most part, consensual sex. But what you want to target are the traffickers. And what I would love to see happen in North and the South of Ireland is the introduction of a charge of aggravated trafficking so that we send out a clear message to these people that we as an industry will not tolerate abuses of sex workers like that and certainly not as a state either, but that we acknowledge that there are some people who voluntarily go into the industry and we're going to protect those people. So we wouldn't have blood on our hands? Yes. OK, I'm, I'm glad you've clarified that. Oh, yes, so well. I'm back on train. Um, uh, David McElveen, who's one of our MLAs and a policing board member, asked the PSNI for their assessment of the scale of the issue in Northern Ireland. And he's, they, they, in response, they said that there's £30 million a year profit being made through, or, through prostitution in Northern Ireland. Um, where's that money going? Certainly not in my bank account. Right. It, it is a lot of money. And how, 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 what, from your experience and your members, what percentage of that would go to the individual woman as opposed to the gangs uh, and, and the agents who are controlling it? Generally, I think the breakdown with agents tends to be one third to two thirds, but it's been so long since I've, I've worked for an agency now, if I've been independent for years and years. So, um, you know, in terms of labour, we were talking about, you know, we can't possibly call sex work work. Well, it is really because um, I pay my taxes and my national insurance and have done so for years. Right. Um, in a local newspaper, you stated that the International Union of Sex Workers was largely disbanded. Was that qu properly quoted? I don't think that was that was um, a fair quote whatsoever. I, I, what I was trying to get at was that we're gathering strength again, um, certainly in the UK, because um, Mary Honeywell, MEP, is, is um, starting to look into the Swedish model there as well. Right. Again, the same article, you said that your, your, fa your partner and your... Your, sorry, your father um, was very supportive of you in your, your career. Yes. Right. Uh, would, you, uh, would you suggest that a, a son or daughter should get involved in this career? Um, I have a daughter who's the centre of my world. 
Um, I would rather that she, um, I'll just explain if you'll let me finish, I would rather that she didn't get into the sex industry because she's very, very soft. I've brought her up in a protective bubble, my fault entirely. However, I would rather that my daughter grew up in a country where, which was free of stigma and which didn't discriminate against sex workers, um, and that would be my preference. And if your daughter announced someday that having seen your lifestyle and mm. the work you've done, that she was perfectly content to go into the sex trade, uh, would you encourage her? I would try and dissuade her, but at the end of the day, I'm, a, I'm her mother and I love her regardless of what she does. You try to dissuade her, but you regard this just as like any other job. It's a career, it's a profession. No, I did say expressly that it's not for everybody, and I'm totally aware of that. So, uh, you, you, like most people, you'd be quite shocked if your daughter told you she was going into this trade. Well, I'd be quite surprised, I guess, yeah. Yes, I think most of us would. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, you, you also said in an interview, actually it was in the, in the newsletter, um, uh, in November last year, um, and, and let me just quote what you said. Last month I opened my hotel room door and I have got a personal attack alarm in my hand and this guy was at my door. He was six foot four with a shaven head covered in Union Jack tattoos and I thought, oh my God, I've had it. Hmm. Do you always carry a, a personal alarm? I do, nine times out of ten, yes, I, I have one in my suitcase. Yep. Well, why would you do that if the only time you've ever been in fear is in the bank robbery? <laughs> It's just added protection because, you know, at the end of the day, um, I am a woman, I am on my own, and it just makes sense to me to have some sort, some form of backup there. And have you ever been subject to an attack? And I've never had to use it, no. Uh, and, but have you ever been subject to a physical attack from one of your clients, or have any of the the sex workers that you, you know been subject to a physical attack? Oh, it does happen. I, I personally haven't, but yes, it does happen. I mean, we do, you know, on some of the forums on the internet, you'll see sex workers will, like, um, those warnings go up, so they, we warn each other about problematic clients, and I do read about some of the attacks that happen, yeah. Um, you, your father also said to you that um, he was concerned you would fall foul of the paramilitaries in Northern yes. Ireland. Mm -hmm. why, why did he say that? He was worried for my personal safety. Um, because I've become quite an outspoken campaigner and he was worried that some people, um, I suppose, um, some people who would be less open to, to my views might take exception to what I was saying. So, well, he's my dad, he's going to worry. Well, why would paramilitaries be a, a particular concern? I don't know why he said that. That is a direct quote, though. Yeah. Um, uh, I, d I thought that was an interesting remark that he was concerned yeah. about paramilitaries. And yeah, I know. I don't know why they would be particularly interested in what I'm doing either, but there you are. OK. Um, you also said in that interview you'd be upset if your partner or husband bought sex from an escort. Why would that be? Mm, gosh, I don't even remember saying that, to be honest. But Well, because I, th I think if you have um, an interesting... Um, varied and spicy relationship at home, then there's no reason for them to go elsewhere, is there? So do you think it's appropriate for people that are in committed relationships to be going to an escort? We understand that when clients come to see me, sometimes they tell me they're married, sometimes they tell me they're not. I'm never to know if they're telling the truth or not. Mm. And it's, to be honest, it's, it's not my business to ask either. I, I take them absolutely at face value. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ms McCorley? For my other is Carly. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, whenever we were in Sweden, we were told uh, that um, as a result of the law in Sweden, there had been negative impacts for people who were working in, in the sex industry. And uh, I, was, I was wondering, you have referred to what you think the implications of this law might be, but is there anything further you would want to add to that? what you think might be the effects on people who work in the sex industry? I think it would um, increase stigma a hell of a lot if it's further criminalised, and that can only be a very, very bad thing. It will prevent sex workers for, for, from reaching out for support and for help as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on very briefly was my work with disabled um, individuals. I'm registered with, um, we call it the Tender Loving Care website in the UK, and a large degree of my work now actually is dealing with disabled guys and indeed terminally ill guys. So that's not just something that we kind of throw out there to try and, you know, further our cause. It's very real. I do work with a lot of those people and um, I feel very privileged to do so actually, to be able to bring that pleasure into their lives for a short period of time. 
See, see in terms of the stigma, yes. how would uh, decriminalising the sex worker and criminalising the purchaser um, result in further stigmatisation of the sex worker? Because the number of people in the UK who um, already think it's illegal is quite frightening. People just don't know the law. Um, and I find that time and time again when I go into interviews. But if you criminalise the purchaser, you're effectively say saying that the whole transaction is illegal and therefore it puts a, an, an onus back on the sex worker as well. So it's not just the, the buyer that will be affected, it will be the sex worker as well. In our country, it's, it's often the sex worker actually who is going to be prosecuted. It's not the purchaser and this particular bill puts the focus on the purchaser and actually is there to support the sex worker. It decriminalises the sex worker. Um, so in terms of stigmatisation, mm -hmm. Um, maybe I'm wrong, uh, but whenever we were in Sweden and we asked this question around stigmatisation, um, it was the sex workers who often felt more empowered. They felt more capable of being uh, in a position to protect themselves because they were able to go to the police. They were able to go to the police about violent individuals. Uh, they weren't ever going to face prosecution, but the person who had carried that out and who had purchased um, the sex or whatever the service was from them, they were the ones where the law was going to come down upon them. So uh, I, f I find it difficult to understand the argument that this would further stigmatise the sex worker when, in fact, it should be doing the opposite. Be well, if you look at f uh, Canada, for example, they've decriminalised it on the basis that they've acknowledged that sex worker rights are human rights and should be viewed as such within um, their constitution. So that's a huge step forward. And I think with, that that would gain greater acceptance in the mind of, of Joe Public around the whole issue of sex work. Yeah, but for, for some of us, um, it, we don't need any research. We don't need any evidence. For some of us, the very principle of um, purchasing sex off a woman would be it's sexual violence, full stop. Um, and that's a principled position that some people don't need to have an evidence base to come to that conclusion on, and that actually, um, currently, men are empowered to continue to subject this type of activity upon women. And if you're in favour of equality, which I am, mm -hmm. then this is about making sure there's gender equality, because currently, um, in my view, there isn't equality. Men are continued to be empowered to allow their own sexual gratification to be inflicted upon women. Mm. In terms of gender equality, I mean, I, I feel empowered as a woman to be able to support myself through university um, and support my family without, you know, um, paying my bills and seeing my way through life. Um, my clients treat me with the utmost of respect because I absolutely insist upon it. Um, and so, and so, you know, to be flippant for a moment, um, as a five foot nine dominatrix, if anyone's inflicting anything on anybody else, it's the clients. Um, Address then how you change the attitude of society and that I had a group of students here actually in Stormont across the, the corridor and we had a discussion and one of the questions I was asked was on this very issue, the, the criminalisation of the payment for sexual services. And the young fella who, probably around 15, said um, that should be a woman's right if they want to uh, sell their body um, and it should be a man's right to, to be able to buy their body. Um, the other girl of a similar age was aghast and disgusted mm -hmm. and said, my body's not for sale. And um, clearly she had a different opinion as to what this boy had. And, and sadly, my experience of society is often it's the fellas that go about bragging about how many times they've been able to get it from such and such. Um, and it's society who often looks as the girl who can be promiscuous as the slut. But the man's almost held up as some kind of hero and he's a legend. Mm, so know. clearly there's a societal problem. Um, and would this law not actually help to address that societal issue? I don't think so. I view sex workers' rights um, in the same regard as, for example, um, homosexuals. And I think as a society we've come so far in recognising gay rights in terms of their cohabitation, adoption, etc. And I, I just don't see why sex workers' rights are lagging so far behind. Um, but hopefully, hopefully we will catch up. And it is a bit of societal change, you're absolutely right. And it is painfully, <coughs> painfully slow, but we are getting there. How many homosexuals have ever said to you that they believe um, we shouldn't be changing the law here in Northern Ireland? For you to say that this is, you're equating sex workers' rights as the same as 
issues around homosexuals. On, mm. on what basis could you make that assertion? I'm saying that because um, homosexuals as a group were very much discriminated against for a long time as well. Yeah. Um, and there was a lot of myths. So, for example, where I come from, when I was growing up, certainly homosexuals were placed in the same category in the, in the minds of some people as paedophiles. They were just thought of as these strange men. Horrible, horrible thing to say, but it's entirely true. Now, of course, we're far more enlightened as a society and we know that, you know, that's just not the case. That's, what, that's where we are with sex work, I think, is that People have this stereotypical image of what we're like. You know that, uh, like quite obviously I'm not a drug addict. Um, I don't have a pimp. I do my job because I choose to do it and I enjoy it. Um, and it's, it's about trying to break down that stereotype. What you're not saying is that all homosexuals support the rights of prostitution. You're not saying that. No, no, no. <clears throat> I was merely drawing um, a similarity between the two groups. OK, no, I appreciate that. Mr Dixon? Yeah, thank you. Can I thank you for your, your very honest and very open presentation to us today. Can I just query one area with you, uh, and that's in relation to the union. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I'm aware that the International Union of Sex Workers is affiliated to the GMB trade union. Yes. Yet, and the GMB trade union in turn is affiliated both to the uh, TUC and to the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. Mm -hmm. Both of whom would have fairly different, certainly the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, for example, supporting the uh, Turn Off the Red Light campaign, uh, and would, would probably uh, not be particularly uh, supportive of some of the views that you've expressed. How has the GMB dealt with that? The GMB, to my knowledge, now has a separate sex work branch. Yes. Um, based in London. Yes. Um, and so they've obviously made their stance on that fairly clear, but. Um, other than that, I'm not terribly well versed on the GMB, I must be honest. Okay. Well, that's fine, thank you. Okay. Mr Elliot. Sure, thanks. Thank you for that. Um, in your written submission, you make four bullet points about the, the Swedish model. And it's very difficult to ask you, but there is no evidence, because you can't demonstrate that, only they can demonstrate the opposite. But the last two, you, you indicate that there is evidence of an increase in danger to sex workers through more dangerous forms of work and less opportunity to screen clients. Can yes. you explain that a bit further? Certainly. So that's um, primarily in relation to street sex work. So because the, the buyers are now deemed criminals, the sex worker has less of an opportunity to, I suppose, assess her client when he pulls up to the curb. It's a split second thing. She's just into the car and gone. Whereas before they could, the sex workers have reported that they could kind of take their time, maybe see if there's a smell of alcohol or whatnot, or assess the guy in some way. But now it's into the car and off. And in that regard, they have um, less protection. OK, so it's mainly for street workers? Yes, I hope. Thank you, Chair. OK, any other members? Yes. Mr Anderson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, you touched on the service yourself, asked a question about the uh, safety aspect and, and you carrying a, a personal alarm. Mm -hmm. uh, would you not say that you're overplaying or overstating playing the fact that uh, prostitution is a safe industry when probably it's not. If you're so sure, like in that chair, the chair has just done it, why uh, carry this personal alarm around? You know, I know people are encouraged to protect themselves, but yeah. are you trying to portray, what I'm trying to get at, are you trying to say, look, that the, the prostitution and sex trade is no more uh, safer or less safer than any other? Uh, well, I believe it, it depends on which area of the sex industry that you work in as well. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, um, obviously, at my, I suppose, end of the of the industry, it's um, attacks are incredibly rare, thank goodness. Um, the personal attack alarm was actually a gift from a client who insisted I bring it with me, so because he because he cares. So you would agree then that they're dependent on the sphere you work in or what area you work in within mm -hmm. this that there could be uh, serious safety aspects to it? There could be, absolutely, but I also worked for a bank where I was hauled across the counter by my bow tie because... You do claim that through this union that you represent uh, all the, the, the numbers, and we're not sure what the numbers are. No. They'll try to find that out. But you are saying then that maybe at different levels here of what it is, that for safer levels, and you work in the safer level? Yes, I would say so, yeah. That's a fair statement to make. But would you agree then that there are serious issues regarding safety of uh, young girls and, and, and young women, indeed all women or anyone in that industry? Well, there are issues regarding safety for young women and, um, 
in many industries, I would imagine. Um, but yes, of course. I'm not taking say in many industries, but would you not say that this has more probability of being less safe than others? It really depends. You're trying on to put this on the same level of another industry that would be less safe. No, it's not that. It's, it really depends on what way you work. I think. So if you, if you work like in a brothel and you've got other sex workers there to help keep you safe, then obviously that's going to be safer than working on your own in a hotel room. So if you're asking me, if, is it an, an inherently dangerous industry? Um, I wouldn't. I don't think so. No. Yes, attacks happen, but attacks happen um, all the time. So you say you're not portraying it as a safe sort of industry? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Would you say you're not portraying it as a safe sort of industry in which to work? Speaking for myself, um, I have found it to be um, incredibly safe and, and <coughs> I've never had any concerns for my personal safety, so... OK, thank you. Jim, just a couple of final questions. Uh, first of all, um, you, you say that you, you model your life, you're inspired by Cynthia Payne. Yes. Yes, um, I, I certainly think some of us remember uh, Miss Payne. And yet she was convicted of exploiting women in the sex trade. Mm. Why, why would you want to sort of uh, hero worship someone who had such a, an unsavory past? Well, I wouldn't say hero worship. That's a very strong term to use. Um, um, I, well, I, I remember reading about her when I was obviously younger, and um, she ran a house, but. <clears throat> Of, of ill repute, if you want, if you remember the luncheon voucher parties and etc., that she got done for in the end. Um, but the one thing that struck me about her was that she was terribly matriarchal and she really, really cared about her clients and she also really, really cared about her girls. And I've since met a lady who worked for her who, could, who can back that up. And she came across to me as just quite a caring individual. And that was what I liked about it. This is a safe industry where 127 women have been murdered in Holland. This is the same industry. We've all been prostitutes. Yes. All in legal brothels. Yes. And you're saying it's safe? Well, in my experience, has yeah, been that. But it's unsafe in Sweden where one has died in 15 years. Um, just, uh, do you run a, a, a website known as lovelylauralee.co.uk? Yes, that's right. my work website. In that uh, website, you make frequent mention of pimps that you know. Right. Um, uh, how many do you know? How many pimps do you Are know? Are you referring to my blog now, is it? Yes, yes. All oh, right, OK. How many pimps do, do you know? Gosh, I don't know. I, well, I know quite a few people who would like run flats or parlours or whatnot. Just from so, so people who control prostitution. Speaking to them online, basically. Yeah, that's a criminal offence in the UK. Mm -hmm. right. How many of those people have you reported to the authorities? Well, in some in some regard, it is um, the women working together for safety. So it's not like it's more like a cooperative, if you, if you will, that they, they work alternate days in the flat. Now, strictly speaking, under the terms of the current law, that's that constitutes a brothel, even though they may never even meet, but work alternate days. Um, that's a brothel. <coughs> and bizarrely, both of the women can be convicted for pimping each other. No, I'm talking about one, for instance, who repeatedly earned eighty thousand pounds a month pimping women in England. Would you say that that fell into that category? Uh, well, no, obviously that's entirely different. So presumably you reported him to this? No. These are, these are all hymns, actually, rather than hers. You mentioned right. about women. But you, in your blog you mentioned he's, hymns, reals, who are in the controlling... How many of those have you reported to the police? I haven't reported any to the police. Haven't, right, even though on, under GB legislation, mm. that's a criminal act. <coughs> yes. Right, so... Uh, so again, it emphasises this link between your union and those who are making vast amounts out of trading women for sex. I don't think that's a particularly fair thing to say. I'm speaking more in terms of my own um, experience as an Irish sex worker. I have very, very little contact with, the, with um, these people that you're talking about. You mention them frequently enough in your blog, but maybe uh, you haven't got around to report them to the guards of the PSNI. Thank you, Mr Chairman. You, you said earlier that um, you feel privileged to have brought joy into the lives of people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, do they have to charge? Do you, do you charge them? Yes, but I do, like a discounted rate. Do a discounted rate? Mm -hmm. Do not rather do it free? <coughs> oh, well, I don't know anybody that works for free. These are people with disabilities? If it's such a privilege and you want to bring joy into their lives, why would you exploit a disabled individual and make them pay? It's not about exploiting anybody. They contact me, not the other way around. And you, you offer them a discount? Of course. Well, you've got, you've got to... Um, in charging a fee, you've got to maintain your boundaries as well. Um, 
In terms of the discount <coughs> level, what's the, what's the discount rate if you're disabled? Uh, well, it depends. Usually it's about a third off or something like that there. Okay, now just going by your rates on, that you publish on your website, mm -hmm. so that's for one hour it's £150, is that yes. correct? Um, and I think two weeks is £8,500? Yes. Um, so you would give a, a disabled person a third off any of those fees? Mm -hmm. um, so if the £150, you would charge £100? It, well, it depends on his individual circumstances, like how long it would take me to travel to see him, etc. So you're charging a, a disabled, vulnerable person £100? They, again, I'm not targeting these people. They come to me because they've decided this is something they want to do. And how do you um, find out that they're disabled? Do, do they need to bring a letter from their GP? or? No, they tell me expressly when they're in an email correspondence. And, and how would you verify, though? Obviously, now people will know that you will provide a third off your, your normal rates. Mm -hmm. How can you be sure, then, that everyone who contacts you herein won't say, I'm disabled? Or are you just going to give everybody then the discount? Well, it's usually, you know, fairly obvious. I mean, some, some of the guys I see are just are basically bed-bound. Um, so, you know, there's no disputing it, really. Um, just my final question, and then unless any other members have any more comments, that, that'll complete the session. Um, and, and you've obviously painted this picture from you as an individual that you've never been subjected to any violence. Um, you enjoy your work. Do you think that we should be protecting your right, or indeed, let's go further, and legalising the sex trade in Northern Ireland so that your right could be um, protected. Is that something that we should do, given the knowledge that we have from the PSNI that the majority of people trafficked into Northern Ireland are brought in for sexual slavery, that women and girls are subject to gang rape? Um, and suffer the most intol intolerable sexual abuse, physical, mental abuse. And when we read the Irish Medical Organisation's report about the health consequences for people that are involved in the industry, I think they indicate you're 12 times uh, more likely to die early if you're involved in this trade mm -hmm. than somebody else in society. Do you believe your right should override all of those other issues that come with the sex industry? I believe that if two consenting adults come together to have sex behind closed doors, then whether or not money changes hands, the state should not intervene. Where the state should intervene is where there is harm, either to the buyer, the seller, or anybody in between. I, I would never, ever advocate any form of violence. You know, the horrible things you spoke of there, like gang rape, of course not. Um, but I do think that, yes, to protect our rights as workers, but obviously to protect the most vulnerable as well. But what if the state's most effective way to protect those people that are being subjected to this type of physical violent abuse is to criminalise the purchase of sexual services? If that's the best way to protect those people that suffer that type of abuse, is that not the right thing for the state to do? But I don't believe that is the best way to protect those people who are really, really suffering. I don't. I believe the best way forward is to create some form of joint committee where sex workers can get on board, work with the police, and actively go and make sure these people are working of their own volition and that they're quite safe. Yeah, well, um, Laura or Anton Antoinette, can I thank you very much for taking the time to come and see us here at the committee? Thank you we, very much. we appreciate the time you've given us. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, members, thank you for that. Moving on, um, at this stage I need to nip out of the room for 10 minutes and the Vice Chair isn't here so I will need amongst you uh, to pick someone who can chair the proceedings for the next 15 minutes to run through the agenda. If you want. Who's Mr Oil? I just put who's him. <laughs> Is the committee agreeable? Agreed, agreed. Yeah. No,
Good I can feel the guitar surging from my veins. Keep it quiet. Look, I think it might be miserable for the creative. If you keep them right. Ten minutes, you have gone. You're wasting your time. <laughs> Two seventy grand a year staff and a salary. It's great. Could I refer members to pages sixty-seven to sixty-nine of the meeting folder? And the Department of Justice has written regarding amendments being made to the prisoner transfer law by way of the Offenders Rehabilitation Act or Bill at Westminster. The main change is that the bill makes for, uh, in England and Wales for England and Wales is to introduce a standard two year licence and or supervision period for all prisoner releases. During that supervision period new breach arrangements will be available that could result in a fine up to foot or up to fourteen days in prisons or a supervision default order with for example unpaid work requirement. Um, in Northern Ireland, a provision already exists to allow prisoners from one jurisdiction to be transferred to another. A person from Northern Ireland convicted of an offence in England Wales can therefore serve a sentence or licence paid in Northern Ireland, or vice versa. The Minister of Justice is of the view that such transfers continue to be available and has therefore agreed for the consequential amendments to be made to allow transfers to continue. He does not, however, agree to the importing of the supervision draft order into Northern Ireland courts, as this will com is a completely new disposal which has been done without any consultation. A legislative consent motion releasing to the changes is not required, as the bill is changing substantive prisoner law for England and Wales only. Um, I'm asking members to note the position regarding the offender rehabilitation bill and amendments to allow prisoners to continue to transfer and seek views as to whether any further information is required. Any thoughts on this? Just noted, I'm happy yes, enough? Noted, yes, noted, okay. Yeah. Then draft um, agenda item nine, the draft modern slavery bill. And I refer members to pages 71 to 137 of the meeting folder for the relevant papers. Uh, the Home Secretary has published a draft modern slavery bill. I'm sure many of you have sp spotted this in the media. An accompanying white paper on the 16th of December 2013. The bill sets out a number of legislative proposals intended to strengthen law enforcement law enforcement's response to slavery and human trafficking. Some of the proposals have implications for Lord Morrow's human trafficking and exploitation, exploitation bill. Um, the Minister of Justice intends to undertake a consultation exercise on the provisions contained in the draft modern slavery bill and accompanying white paper. The consultation will also seek views on the most effective means of taking forward any necessary legislation. Depending on the outcome of the consultation exercise, there may be scope for certain provisions to be incorporated into the human trafficking bill, but the legislative time scales could be challenging and would require the support of the committee. So I think it's quite apt that we're actually discussing this immediately after the three hearings. Um, could I ask members to note the modern slavery bill and the accompanying white paper published by the Home Secretary on the 16th of December 2013 and advise members that departmental officials will be attending the meeting next week to provide further information on the bill and the proposed consultation and also to answer any members' questions. And are we happy with that? That will add another block to our meeting next week. Uh, agenda item 10 is a legal aid and coroner's court bill. Can I refer members to pages 139 to 148 of the meeting folder for all the relevant papers? Members will recall, of course, on the 17th of October, the committee agreed that it was content with the minister's proposal for, that a number of additional clauses that replicated a number of provisions in the Access to Justice Northern Ireland Order 2003, most of which had not been convinced and should be included in the Legal Aid and Coroner's Court Bill, and that would be scrutinised the clause when the bill comes to committee, uh, the provisions related to Legal Aid Reform Programme. Uh, the Minister has now written indicated that following advice from the Legislative Council, he intends to take a different approach to the drafting of the changes. Instead of repealing the access to Justice Northern Ireland Order 2003 and moving, into clauses, moving clauses into the Legal Aid Advice and Assistance Northern Ireland Order 1981, he proposes to retain the 2003 order and commence the civil legal service provisions in Articles 10 and 20 without the funding code provisions contained in Articles 15 and 16. According to the Minister, the policy terms will remain the same, but in drafting terms it will be simpler and result in a much shorter bill. And I'm sure <laughs> members uh, are absolutely up to date on this issue. Uh, and I can see where the chair left for the next 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Can I advise member that the revised drafting approach has delayed the bill and the minister now plans to introduce it early this year 
with the aim of having the Royal Assent, very important, before the summer recess. Given the fact that the time scale, the Minister has indicated that it would be helpful as the Committee would look forward, look favourably, at keeping the Committee stage as short as possible. Uh, can I ask members to note the revised approach outlined by the Minister in relation to the Legal Aid and Coroner's Court Bill and seek views on whether any further information is required prior to the introduction of the Bill? How do members feel about this? Bring it on. As you know, we have quite a lot on our plate at the minute. Um, is anybody exercised about this? Sure, there is no timetable with it, is it? What is proposed timetable is? I know he did indicate there from what you said it, to have it uh, royal assent by summer recess, but. That's quite tight because that means it has to have gone through here yeah. by May. They're aiming, yeah, they're aiming to have, well, they're hoping to introduce it, I think, probably in early February now. I think they were hoping maybe to take it to the executive. It hasn't gone to the executive yet. Okay. needs to go to the executive. Um, it hasn't gone to the executive and still needs to go through a committee stage. Yeah. Well, they want, he wants that as short as possible. I think the issue is um, the bill was originally meant to be very small um, and the committee had asked um, myself earlier on at an earlier stage to look at whether there was a possibility of doing some sort of targeted consultation on it because most of the clauses relate to changing the status of the Legal Services Commission, which has been consulted upon. Mm -hmm. um, the Minister had then written indicating that he was intending to move some of the clauses from this um, access to justice order into this bill, and that might have opened it up a bit more, um, and there might have been more issues that people would have commented on. But my understanding from this is now the draft of the Legislative Council has indicated that that's not the best way to do it, and they're taking, you know, those clauses are no longer going to be imported into this bill. They're going to come through by commencement order, but the clauses, um, those clauses by commencement order, all require the board and legislation, which will have to come to committee and draft um, and proposals at various stages anyway. So the bill now looks like it will be much shorter again than originally anticipated. But even with that, it is still a very tight time scale. If that will add to our workload from now to recess. Um, any other comments on this? Just to say to members, the department are intending, as soon as the bill is introduced, to brief the committee before second stage so that members can raise any or, or ask any questions on the principles of the bill at that stage. So that's helpful. Okay. Can we move on then to agenda item 11, SR 2013-293, the legal aid for Crown Court proceedings costs, amendment rules northern Ireland 2013. Could I refer members to pages 150 to 159 of the meeting folder for the relevant papers? As members will remember, on the 5th of December, the committee considered and agreed that it was content with the proposal for statutory rule to introduce new fixed fees for preparation work where... Following the conviction of an assisted person, there is a change of representation and the court grants a fresh criminal, aid certificate, criminal legal aid certificate, I presume that is, for the purposes of the sentence hearing before the court. That's the Crown Court, of course. Can I advise members that Statutory Rule No. 2013-293 was led by the Department of Justice on the 9th of December 2013. It's subject to the negative resolution procedure. Uh, the Department had previously advised that the operation date would be in breach of the 21-day rule to enable the rule to be available for a defendant appearing in the Crown Court on the 13th of December 2010. The rule came into operation on the 9th, I assume that's 2013. Yes, the rule came into operation on the 9th of December 2013. There has been no changes to the policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the committee. And the examiner of the statutory rules, that's the assembly's examiner of statutory rules, has confirmed that there are no issues to raise with regard to the technical aspects of the rule. Are members content with the statutory rule? Mm -hmm. Then, if the committee are content, can I go through the, the, the formal reading? That the Committee for Justice considered Statutory Rule 2013, number 293, the legal aid for Crown Court proceedings, costs, amendment rules, Northern Ireland 2013 and has no objections to the rule. All agreed? Yeah. Agreed. OK. Then can I move on to item number 12 on the agenda, which is SR 2013-278, 278, the Insolvency Amendment Rules Northern Ireland 2013. Could I refer members to pages 161 to 176 of the, the meeting pack? Uh, turn that to um, uh, 
you will recall on the 14th of June 2012, uh, uh, the committee considered and agreed that it was content with the proposal for a statutory rule to amend the insolvency Northern Ireland Rules 1991, which lay down detailed procedure rules governing the administration of company and individual insolvencies in Northern Ireland. The purpose of the rule is to protect the social fund from the impact of direct relief orders and bankruptcy proceedings. I just say that the statute rule number 2013-278 was laid by the Department of Justice on the 3rd of December 2013 and again is subject to negative resolution procedure. There have been no changes to the policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the committee and the examiner of statutory rules has confirmed that there are no issues to raise with regard to the technical aspects of the rule. Can I ask members, are they content with the statutory rule? Yeah. Yeah. As a, as a committee are con content, can I put the formal wording that the Committee for Justice considers Statute Rule 2013, number 278, <coughs> the Insolvency Amendment Rules, Northern Ireland 2013, <coughs> and has no objection to the rule? Anyone happy? Okay. Sorry, no objection, but just wondering why it came to us. This isn't that anything? Um, it does, it sits with Teddy, but the power to make the rule sits with the Department of Justice. So at the time when we were looking at the proposals, we consulted with the ETI <laughs> committee, and they were content with it. So. Okay. I've had three successful resolutions in 15 minutes, so I'm on a good run here. <laughs> uh, could I move on then to item 13 on the agenda, proposals for a secondary legislation to facilitate the introduction of a filtering scheme for access NI checks? <coughs> and could I refer <laughs> members to pages 178 to 225? of your pack, which contains all of the relevant <laughs> papers. Very offensive. Um, can I remember, members, that changes to criminal record checks and the information disclosed is required following recent court rulings? At our meeting of the 17th of October 2013, <laughs> the committee received a briefing from Department of Justice officials on the proposed introduction of a statute-based filtering scheme for access Northern Ireland checks similar to those now operating in England and Wales. Uh, that was to filter out convictions that are both old and minor and disposals such as cautions. Following the briefing, the committee agreed that it was content with the department to bring the proposals to the executive and we would consider the matter in due course. The Department of Justice has now brought forward three proposed statutory rules to implement the filtering scheme for access and disclosures. One rule is subject to affirmative resolution procedure, with the other two subject to negative resolution procedure. The rules will amend the definition of what is to be disclosed by Access NI in response to an application for a criminal record certificate or an enhanced criminal record certificate. Specific offences which will never be filtered allows for the disclosure of cautions, diversionary youth conferences and informed warnings held on the Causeway system and enables some old and minor convictions to be filtered from criminal record disclosures. Can I seek members' views on whether they are content with the proposed statute rules and other, whether any further information is required? I very clearly remember that hearing. We went into it in quite yes. great length. Yes, you're well mentioned or not. Content. <laughs> are members content that we yep. proceed with this? Um, can we then move on to agenda item 14, Attorney General for Northern Ireland's draft guidance for the Public Prosecution Service and the Northern Ireland Prison Service on the exercise of their functions in a manner consistent with the international human rights standards? And can I refer you to pages 227 to 270 of your uh, packs? Could I remind you that uh, the Attorney General is required under Section 8 of the Justice Northern Ireland Act 2008 to issue guidance to named criminal justice organisations on the exercise of their functions in a matter consistent with the international human rights standards? And could I advise members that the Attorney General has now provided the draft guidance he has prepared for the Public Prosecution Service and the Northern Ireland Prison Service? Um, could I seek members' views on whether comments from the Public Prosecution Service and the Prison Service on the draft guidance should be requested, or whether the Attorney General should be invited to discuss it with us. What's the feeling of the committee? Chair, I think that both organisations should be requested to see what their views is on it. Now, is that in writing or to come before the committee? In yeah. writing, initially. In writing, yeah. I presume if there's anything that comes up in the written submissions, yeah, the members are unhappy with it, yeah. and then. Yeah. Yeah. 
go ahead and ask. And is that food also the, the Attorney General? Yeah. We ask, we want something from him in writing, or are we happy to wait to see what the prison service and the PPS says? Wait for the response. It'd be better, yeah. I think, if you want to get the views of PPS and prison service, then when you yeah. see whether they have any issues, yeah. okay. yeah. 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 members happy? Yep, yeah. away. Can I move on then to agenda, agenda item? 15. The proposal <coughs> to amend the regulations of the salary of the Lands Tribunal members under the Lands Tribunal and Compensation Northern Ireland Act 1964. And could I refer members to pages 272 to 274? What do we get? I remember reading these and thinking that I'd taken up the wrong career. <laughs> um, <laughs> extremely <laughs> lucrative, but uh, that's not for me to, to come at all. Right. The, 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 the Lands Tribunal and Compensation Act, Northern Ireland, 1964, provides that the Department of Justice may, by a subject, a rule subject to affirmative resolution, determine the salary of the members of the Land Tribunal. The Lands Tribunal consists of a president who does not receive a salary under the 1964 Act, as the post is held by the Lord Chief Justice of Appeal. I would now hand back to the chair and thank members You're for their support. Well, Jim, you should have stayed there. <laughs> um, yeah, th this particular item, you remember we had this discussion in the Assembly, uh, we had an affirmative resolution to do an increase of around 1%. I expressed my own personal view that um, this was quite strange, given that it's out of keeping with all the other um, judicial office holders and how their salaries are um, dealt with. Um, the Minister has now looked at that as well, and he's looked at the Hansard of um, whenever this was first brought in. Um, he's indicated that he thinks there may be an opportunity through the uh, uh, Public Service Pension Bill to maybe bring an amendment to bring this into line with the other judicial office holders. I had indicated my own personal view that that's something that I, I would be supportive of. Um, and he's obviously now seeking the view of the committee. Is that something that we as a committee would be content with? And he will then seek to, uh, uh, if possible, because it may not be within the scope of that bill to bring forward an amendment, um, but that's something that he, I think, would be keen to, to test and see if that uh, that could be done. That bill's, sorry, Chair, that, that bill is coming to us next week. It, it is. It's, it, it's, it, uh, he would have had to put an amendment to it. I, from memory, I don't think he has. But no, no. But so there is still time. There is still time. There is oh, still okay. time. Just uh, there no. is still time, and, and certainly I'm content. Yeah. Um, that it, it would be done uh, and would be dealt with. Um, Obviously, it's still subject to the same scrutiny, scrutiny as all the other um, office holders of a similar nature. So, to me, it, it makes sense. I don't think it's it's something that um, should cause us concern. So, if members are happy, we'll indicate to the minister to go ahead and, and find out if he can bring forward an amendment that would be in keeping with what we discussed. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Item 16 is consultation on the domestic and sexual violence and abuse strategy. Um, <coughs> members are asked to note the launch of the public consultation on the new uh, strategy will take place in the near future, uh, and as well are members of any particular views um, at this stage, or whether we're content for officials to come in due course to brief a committee on the results of the exercise and then the final version of the draft. So if members are content. Um, item 17 is the... Uh, supervised activity order pilot schemes. Um, we had wrote to the department uh, in June two, 2013 to request a copy of the evaluation report um, of the supervised activity order pilot schemes in Newry and Lisburn, which had come to an end. The department has now provided a copy of that report, which only covers the Newry pilot scheme, as the pilot scheme in Lisburn had only a small number of cases, and the department didn't feel that it was profitable to conduct a further evaluation. Uh, the evaluation indicates supervised um, Orders have the potential to be a useful part of the response to fine enforcement in the future. Minister intends to bring forward legislation to establish a new fine collection enforcement service, uh, which uh, will be available, which will be able to avail of a wider range of collection options as part of this. Uh, intends to roll out the supervised activity orders with the aim of limiting the use of custody um, for fine default. So it's whether members have any more views on the, the evaluation report or at this stage um, we're content to note its content. Okay, noted. 
Item 18 is correspondence, and there's 20 items of correspondence, um, and one item in the table pack, so let me draw attention to a couple of them. Item uh, 1 is a response from the Department to the Committee's request for information on how it can satisfactorily resolve the issue of the lack of accreditation and certificates for courses delivered to prisoners by Action Mental Health in McGabry Prison. Um, just advise members funding has been secured from the Big Lottery Fund to provide a new accredited um, course. So if members are content, we'll forward that response to the uh, Action Mental Health for their information. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Item 2 is uh, correspondence from the Department um, providing additional information on the scale of the drugs problem and detection rates in Northern Ireland prisons. Um, so if members note this and whenever we have obviously the prison service back in front of the committee, it'll be something that um, I think we will wish to return to. Item 5 is correspondence from the Department advising that the Prison Service Pay Review Body has recommended payment of a supplementary risk allowance to post-2002 operational uh, prison grade staff until such times as the security situation improves to the extent that an allowance is no longer justified. Overall cost of the recommendation is in the region of 1.6 million per annum and the prison service management are considering how the allowance uh, could be financed from existing budgets. So if members are agree agreeable I would like to pursue this further to get an update on how the allowance will be financed and the time scale um, within which payments will be made. It's something that this committee has taken interest in. Um, uh, obviously now the pay review body has made a recommendation. It's my understanding that the trade union and the management of the prison service are in discussions to try and uh, agree a way to, to advance this. Um, uh, and I certainly don't want it to be left um, by the wayside. So I, I would like to know from the department um, how they're going to be dealing with. The, the minister has indicated that there are no additional resources to fund this. Um, and in my view, this is something that's an inescapable pressure, uh, and we, we need to ask the department how they are going to ensure that this is delivered upon. So, if members are content, we will write to the department um, asking them for that information, um, and we will await the response. And if necessary, this is something that I will continue to pursue, hopefully with the support of this committer, committee, and if needs be, we'll bring the minister here, because this is over a thousand members of staff who uh, have made significant. Uh, c contributions to the job that they do under a threat, uh, and it's, it's right that they get the support that they deserve. Um, but hopefully, uh, the, the negotiations will will progress and they'll get a resolution to it. So, if members are content, we will write to the department about that. Agreed. Item 8 is correspondence from the Committee for the Environment, uh, providing a copy of the terms of reference for its inquiry into wind energy and requesting any comments by the 28th of February. Um, just advise members the inquiry does not cover justice issues and therefore there isn't a specific committee response that is necessary. Item 11 is a criminal justice inspection report monitoring of progress and implementation of youth justice review recommendations, which was published on the 17th of December. Um, Departmental officials are due to attend the meeting on the 6th of February to provide an update on the implementation of the Youth Justice Review and an oral briefing by the Chief in uh, Inspector could also be scheduled for that date if members felt it was necessary. So we have the report. We'll have departmental officials that will come in um, to obviously uh, discuss this and members will be able to use the report if, if members are content uh, with that approach. Okay. Um, Item 1 of the table pack is correspondence from the Minister advising uh, that an accelerated passage bill uh, to deal with the issue of enforcement of fines is no longer required as a lawful enforcement procedure can be implemented through court rules. Magistrate Court's Rules Committee has developed and agreed rules to create a procedure allowing fine default hearings to be held and details of the new rules procedure will be provided to the committee separately. So unless members have any other comments around the correspondence, we'll agree to action it as outlined. Agreed. I have no business, any other business. There's no other business then. Our next meeting is 16th of January.